Hello, I'm Svetlin Naku from SoftUni, the Software University. Together with my colleague George Karkiev, we continue teaching this free Java Foundations course, which covers important concepts from Java programming, such as arrays, lists, maps, methods, strings, classes, objects, and exceptions, and prepares you for the Java Foundations official exam at Oracle. In this lesson, your instructor, George, we explain the concepts of associative arrays or maps, which hold key to value mappings. He will demonstrate through live coding examples how to use standard API classes such as map, hash map, and tree map to work with maps in Java. Just after the maps, the instructor will explain the concepts of lambda expressions and how to define and use lambda functions in Java through the arrow operator. Lambda expressions are important in Java programming because they enable processing and querying Java collections using the Java Stream API. In this lesson, the instructor will demonstrate the power of the Stream API and how to map, filter and sort sequences of elements such as arrays, lists and maps, and how to extract subsequences how to convert a sequence to array or list, and many other operations over sequences. Let's learn maps, lambda functions, and the stream API in Java through live coding examples, and later solve some hands-on exercises to gain practical experience. Are you ready? Let's start! Before we dive into the course, I want to show you the SoftUnit JIT system where you can get instant feedback for your exercise solutions. SoftUni Judge is an automated system for code evaluation. You just send your code for a certain coding problem and the system will tell you whether your solution is correct or not and what exactly is missing or wrong. I'm sure you will love the Judge system once you start using it. Let me show you how you can submit the solutions from your hands-on practical exercises to the automated grading system, the so-called soft unit judge. So you have a judging system designed to send you your code and it tells you whether the code is correct or not. And I will show you how it works. You open this link and you go on this, uh, on this uh, website where is in the soft unit judge and you click click practice and you have this full java full foundation course these are the the problems and here you you put your code just like it's shown here and you submit and you send it so for example let's the first problem student information is this one and this is your solution in java and you want to check whether your solution is correct or not you click submit and it appears here so you can refresh in a few moments and it tells you whether your code is correct or not if you put some incorrect code for example uh, i will format incorrectly the age and the grades of, of, of the uh, of the output and when i click here it tells me that i have all the tests wrong and in this case i can click the details and i can see that it, the expected input is like this uh, the, and my output is this one at, at the right i have one additional digit which is which should not be there so this is how the judge system works it will be your best friend when you are learning uh, java through our training courses because uh, as I repeat many times, uh, learning Java is mostly coding and less watching videos. So you need to practice. That's why we have prepared a lot of coding exercises for you. And please do them because I want you to become Java developers. Before the start, I would like to introduce your course instructors, Svetlin Nakov and George Gurgiev who are experienced Java developers, senior software engineers, and inspirational tech trainers. They have spent thousands of hours teaching programming and software technologies and are top trainers from SoftUni. I'm sure you will like how they teach programming. 
Hello everyone, this is George, I'm your technical trainer, and today we will be talking about associative containers like maps and sets and other, other types of data structures which we will be using quite often actually. Pretty much 80% of the time you're going to be a programmer, you're going to be using some of these collections. And then we're going to talk about Lambda expressions and the stream API in Java. So let's get on with it. Our first subject is again associative arrays or associative containers or dictionaries or maps. There are a lot of terms for these uh, data structures, but they're used in pretty much ev every place in programming you're going to encounter. And not only that, you're going to encounter them a lot because they're very useful uh, both for fast operations on large sets of data when you have some uh, intrinsic characteristic by which you categorize that data. And Additionally, because uh, these associative container, containers are very useful when you want to um, work even with small amounts of data which need to be organized in some way. So they're pretty much a multi-tool for a lot of stuff. Okay, so we're going to talk about the hash map, the linked hash map, and the tree map. Those are the three, the three most common uh, uses of associative arrays or containers or maps or dictionaries or whatever you like to call them. And you might have noticed that Java prefers the terminology map, but associative arrays is a bit more general, general and even associative, associative containers is the most general term you're going to see in computer science. But map is pretty close up with that one too. So you're going to see these containers in a lot of programming languages, not just in Java. Okay, so these are the three most common, or at least the ones we will be using most often in this course. So uh, we will be talking about that today. Then we're going to talk about Lambda expressions and we're going to tie those in with the stream API in Java, talking about filtering, mapping, sorting data and limiting output and uh, processing items one by one and so on. So this is our table of contents and let's get on with it. Well, what are we going to talk about first? Again, the associative containers I already mentioned and we're going to talk about them as these collections of key and value pairs. So you're going to have keys and values in each item in the collection we're going to talk about. So each item in those collections, the linked hash map, the hash map, the tree map are all in this format. They are keys and values. Now, before we go on with the data structures themselves, let's see an example of how they might be useful. So let's open IntelliJ and let's say we have the following task. Um, we're going to get uh, numbers entered and we're going to get the names of those numbers or even let's say we're going to get um, names of people and the ages of these people. And then what we need to do is when uh, asked about the age of some person, we need to print that age or it could be birthdays even. Maybe we can implement a calendar in which we simply enter the names of people we want uh, to remember the birthdays of, and then we can ask when someone's birthday is. So what we're going to have here is the name of a person followed by some data. Now it doesn't really matter what that data is. So let's go with something simple. Let's say we have uh, the name of the person and we have the age of that person. That's the simplest thing we can do for now. Okay, so we're going to get names of people and ages of ages of people. And let's say we're going to have a fixed number of uh, names and ages we're going to have to read from the console. Uh, and we need to read those and then be able to answer questions of the format name of a person. And we need to print that age, the age of that person. Okay, so how do you do that? Well, let's, let's try. Now, first thing I'm thinking about is, okay, I already know what objects and classes are. So one thing I could do is create an object, name it person, and that person is going to have a name and an, and an age since we're, they're going to be traveling together, right? One thing I mentioned is the person will have an age and that age will be um, something which we need to print when asked about the person's name. So the name and the age are correlated. They have an association between them. So one way to implement that is to, of course, create an object which maintains that association, create a class. Let's call it, it's going to be a static, static class. 
let's call it person and then let's say that this person has a name and let's say that this person has an integer age okay so our person has a name and, and an age okay and what else does our person have well let's enable construction of a person so we can create a person and instead of typing it myself i'm going to press alt and insert wait a bit and then I'll get a uh, generate um, tooltip and then I can pick generate prompt actually uh, and then I can pick a constructor and then say that I want name and age to be included in my uh, constructor so IntelliJ auto generated this code for me and now I'm going to do the same thing for getters and setters as we've uh, discussed before getters and setters are ways to access fields of a, of a class so let's insert a getter and a like actually we don't need setters we only need getters because we're not going to be changing the ages of these people we're just going to be uh, asking for them okay so let's have a get name and get age uh, getter and setter and let's make these fields private because we've talked about the um the the good practice of keeping fields of a class private and accessing them through the getters okay so now we have an object which maintains this association of a name with an age of a person okay so what are we going to do now? Well, let's say we have a fixed number of people. Let's say we have an integer number n, which is the number of people. And let's say we're going to be reading that, that from the console. So we're going to need a scanner. Let's create a scanner, which reads from system.in. Okay, so this scanner is going to be initialized over here. And then we'll just say, okay, initialize a variable and initialize that with the first integer on the console, which uh, we've, uh, which has been input. Okay, so this is going to be the number of people we're going to have to read. And now we can say, start a for loop from zero to n. So that's exactly n, n times the loop will execute. And then we're, we're going to be reading the next person. So we're going to be reading a name and we're going to be reading an age. And then we'd say, Okay, so the name is now equal to scanner.read the next string, just next. This is going to read a string separated by spaces. So it's going to read, uh, it's going to trim all white, white spaces before the string, any new lines, tabs, spaces, etc. And trim, trim all of these, and then it will get the string until it reaches another white space. So until it reach, reaches a space, a tab, a new line, etc. Okay, so it doesn't really matter how they're going to input the name of that person as long as that name is one word. Okay, and then we'll do the same for dh. We're going to read it, however, we're going to read it as an integer directly. We're going to read it as a string and then parse it as an integer. Okay, so we have the name and age now read from the console. And we have this person, the current person, the person at index i. And what are we going to do with them? Well, we said that we want to have this data stored somewhere because we're going to have queries on it. So the user will input a name of a person and then we need to print out the age of that person. Okay, so since we're going to be saving uh, a fixed amount of people, what we can do is create an array since we know the amount of people on uh, the the, the first time we're going we're reading the uh, number of people once we have this uh, integer n we know how many people we're going to be reading so I can just create a person array and see say that these are the people and initialize them with a person array containing exactly n elements and then I'd say people and place the person at position i so the person we're reading currently how are, how are we going to place them? Well, we're just going to initialize a new person and provide the name and age for that person, set that into the array, and now we have an array of people. So once the input has been processed, we're going to have an array of people which we can do operations with. Okay, so now let's say we're just going to have a single query, ju just to make the code easier. So how we're going to uh, write that query? Well, let's say we're going to have a query string which we're going to be reading from the console. Scanner.next is reading from the console. Okay, so we're reading that query from the console, the first string in the console we're, uh, that's entered after we've read all the people. And now all we need to do is find the person with that age and print uh, the person with that name and print their age. So what we're going to be doing is how do we find that person? Well, there are a lot of ways to do it. Uh, let's do it manually. So how do you find uh, value in a data set? So we have a data set over here. 
data set just meaning a bunch of data gathered in some variable. So here's our data set. In this case, it's an array uh, of items. These items are person objects. Okay, so how are we going to find the person we're looking for, the person which has a name matching this query? Well, let's just iterate these people. So we're going to say people iterate. We're going to access each person in these people. And then we do what? Well, we check if the query matches the person which we're uh, getting here, but not the person themselves because the query is just a string, right? So the query is just a string. We don't want to match against the person. We want to match against the person's name because the person isn't a string. The person is a combination of a string and an age. Okay, so we're going to get the name over here and compare that name to the query. So if the query matches the name, then we found our person and otherwise we need to continue on. Okay, so if we find the person, we don't need to look anymore unless uh, the task is to print all people which have that age, but let's uh, simplify it to just the first person which has that age needs to be printed on the console. Okay, so now, now what we're going to do, well, since we're breaking the loop here and since we're inside the case where the current person which we're iterating on is the person we're looking for, we just need to print that person's age out on the console. Okay, so what we're going to print is person, person dot get age that will give me the age of this person object over here and i know that this person object is a correct object because otherwise i wouldn't have entered this part of code this uh, line of code which is only entered when the query matches my person's name okay so this little program over here will just read a bunch of people from the console and then operate on them by finding the one with the name which matches and then we're going to print that back on the console. Okay, so let's say that we have two people. One of them is George and George is 27. And let's say we have another person, which is any candidates from you guys. <laughs> okay, so the other person will be Peter because I know a guy named Peter and Peter is, I don't really know how old he is, but eh, let's go for 35. Okay, so George and Peter, and now it's waiting for me to enter the uh, name of the person which, for which we want to print the age. Okay, so let's say we want to print the age for Peter. Okay, so what did we get printed? Well, 35. So that's the solution to this program. Now, uh, to, this, to this problem, this program is the solution to this problem. Now, of course this works and it works reasonably well. So it's, it, in the worst case, it's going to do as, as many iterations on the person list as there are people in that list. So in the worst case, in this case, when I entered two people and I entered Peter, well, it had to first check George, see that it isn't George, and then had to go to the next item, the last item in the list, check, see that it matches and then print that out. Okay, so we might actually want to have a, uh, a check over here, which uh, checks if we found the person if it, and if it doesn't, it prints uh, no such person found and, and so on. Okay, so something you might have noticed if you're uh, watching carefully is that in this case, I need to walk over all of the people in my list, in my array or whatever data structure I have uh, of the ones we've uh, studied so far. I need to walk through all of them, regardless of what I'm looking for, I need to loop through all of them and check for that thing. If that thing matches, then I found the thing I'm looking for. Okay, however, let's imagine that we weren't searching uh, ages of people, but people's ages. So uh, let's say we're going to be reading not the name of a person, we're going to be reading a number, the age of the person, and we need to print the person with that age. Okay, so if you're uh, thinking carefully, you might have noticed that there's a sort of a quicker way to do this, right? So if we're storing, instead of uh, looking for people by their name, printing ages by a name, if instead we're printing a name by an age, and since the ages are relatively low values, people, people usually have an age somewhere between zero and 150 years, okay, so 150. So that's a very small range of values. So let's turn this task around. Let's say that we don't want to be checking for 
a person's name. I, we don't want to be looking for the person by their name. We want to be looking for the person by their age. <coughs> okay, so how would we do that? Well, instead of saving people in a person array, what we're going to do is create... Uh, actually, we're still going to have a person array, but instead of saving the person on the next item in that array, we're going to create an array of, let's say, 150 elements. Now, that's a bit of overkill, but you see where, where I'm going with this. An array of 150 elements, because we expect no person to be older than 150. Okay? And now what we're going to do is instead of placing the person at the next position in the array, we're going to place them in their, at their age position in the array. Right? So what we're doing is instead of having the first person at index 0 and the next person, so index 0, this is George, of, uh, which is 27, and index 1, this is Peter, which is 35. Instead of having this data structure, we're having the following data structure. We're having an entire array over here, and we're saying, let's use a different color, an entire array, and we're saying, okay, so place George at index 27. So index 27 is going to be George, which is 27 years old. So we're saving George of 27 years old, this person object, we're saving at index 27. And then we're saving Peter at index 35. Now notice what we can be doing now if, if the task requires us to enter an age instead of a name. So if this is int age, which we're reading from the console, what can we do? Do we need to loop around through all of the elements in the array? Well, no, we don't no longer, no longer need to because what we've done is indexed, and that's uh, the root of that word. We've placed our items at specific indices and we've coded that so it's fast to access. So if we're reading an H from the console and we've ordered our items like this, directly as items in the array at the position um, of their field which we're indexing so in this case the field which we're indexing is the age field so we're creating an index by this field the same way like uh, the same way that books have indices by their page numbers right so you can see what uh, content is on page number 35 for example okay so so they're indexed by their page numbers in this case we're indexing by our um, by our ages so we're placing the item instead of on the next position in the list or array or whatever it is, we're placing it in a specific position that matches one of its fields in some way. So in this case, we're placing it at the specific position, George, we're placing George at the specific position 27 in the array because 27 in the array matches the 27 years of age which George has. Okay, so now what we can do is we can just say int h equals scanner.next actually is going to be next integer and now instead of looping around through our items we just need to do system.out.println um, the person's name so where is the person well the person is at position h and we need their name so we're accessing the person which we've put at position h when we've read the input and then we're getting the name of that person so starting this code what we're going to get is of course the input is going to be different in this case we're still going to have two people they're still going to be george of 27 years old and peter of 35 years old but here we're not going to be in inputting a name of a person we're going to be inputting an age of a person and see if that age is uh, answered correctly so if i input 35 i should get peter right okay so I ended my program after entering 35 and I got Peter on the output. Okay, that's exactly what I wanted, right? Now, you might have noticed that this is pretty much uh, a, a single operation, right? So you just, yeah, sure, the printing is one operation and the access of the element is one operation and the getting of its name is another operation. So this entire line is three operations, but the number of operations I needed to access my element is exactly one. So one operation of accessing an element 
it at an index of an array. So this is a very fast operation. Accessing items in an array by their index is very fast. It's just like writing to an array at, a, at an index is very fast because an array index is just an address in memory. So the computer just finds that address and writes. It, it has random access to that address in memory. That's why your RAM is called RAM because it's random access memory. It takes the same time to access the first element as it takes to access the 50th element. Okay, so you might have noticed where I'm going with this. Where I'm going is, okay, so we can do it for age, but we can't do it for a name because the name is a string and ages can be integers and uh, can be indices in arrays because indices in arrays are just numbers and ages are just numbers. So you can have an integer which you're mapping onto an array. So you're mapping the age onto the array. You're indexing uh, the, the people we have here by their age. You, you can say it uh, a lot of different ways. Uh, I have a habit of using different terminology so you know what to search for when you're googling something terminology is important because we google with terminology okay so what we've done here is indexed the people we have our data set of people we've indexed them by their age meaning we've put them at indexes ma matching their age but we can't do that for their names so let's say we wanted to go back to the original task which we were solving we were solving the task of reading a name and answering with an age. So let's say we want to index our people with their names, not with their ages. Can I do this? Can I place name over here? Well, no, I can't because the name is a string and the index in people should be an integer. Okay, so I can't do that. Or can I? Well, what I'm looking for here, instead of saving uh, people at index i and then looping through all of them. Now let's go back to the number of operations. The array access was the single access, right? So if I index them by age, I only had to search for, I only had to access that age index. In this case, I have to index, I have to access all indices, right? So I'm looking, I'm looping through the people and I'm accessing every single element, every single index. Now, this should have been n over here once I changed it back to the initial task. So I'm looping through all n of the elements, all of them, in order to find my person. And that's not optimal because I'm doing n operations at the worst case. Sure, in some situations I'm going to have the person uh, be the first item in the list, but uh, it's equally probable that the person I'm looking for is the last item in the list or the array or whatever. Uh, so. It, in the average case, it's n divided by two operations. In the worst case, it's n operations. In programming, you're usually concerned about the average and the worst case. And the worst case really shouldn't be much worse than the average. So uh, because otherwise your program is going to lag once you get enough data in it. OK, so uh, what, are we, what can we do? So this is n operations, whereas the previous uh, solution, the, the solution which uh, looked by age, which indexed by age, was one operation. So one operation versus n operations. The, la the larger amount of data we have, the, the slower this solution is going to work based on the person's name. Uh, and the faster, actually, the, the age uh, task, the, the one which, which we're looking for a name by an age, is always one operation. It doesn't really matter how, how much data items we have. Sure, it matters for reading the data, but that's always the case. It doesn't matter for accessing the data. So once we've indexed the items, it doesn't matter how many items there are. Uh, we just need to search at that index. Whereas for our current case where, where, where we have names, we can't index by name in an array because arrays have integer values and names are strings. So how do we do that? Well, there are data structures in programming which allow you to do that, to index by things that aren't indices, to index by things that are strings or objects or people or whatever. So there are data structures which allow you to do that. And actually, they also allow you to do it for double values. Let's say uh, the ages over here, if my previous task in which I'm looking for a person by their age, well, that wouldn't work if the age was a double number, right? So if I had a person of 3.5 years old, like, um, you know, little kids are usually asked uh, how old they are and they 
often answer with uh, 3.5 or because when you're little 0.5 years is actually a lot it's, it's a big portion of your of your life so if years could be entered like that well our array uh, option doesn't really work anymore because uh, if we just save at that index in the array well 3.1 and 3.2 and 3.5 and 3.9 will all fall into the same index the index 3 in the array so again indexing indexing for now with arrays only works if your indexes are integers and if your indexes indices are small enough numbers because if you have uh, all the integers let's say from 0 to 2 to 2 billion let's say you're counting age by seconds of your lifetime that's about 2 billion for the average person in that case allocating an array of 2 billion 2 billion elements really isn't very practical is it so 2 billion elements that's a lot of memory that's 2 gigabytes of memory if you're just saving single byte values and we're not saving single byte values we're saving a lot more so what can we do well we can we can you're probably thinking of something right now like okay can't we convert this string into a number somehow so each name let's convert it somehow into a number let's for example count the number of letters in it or uh, use uh, the ascii codes of the letters in it and sum them up and get a number and use that number as the index and if you're thinking that you're thinking about hashing that's called hashing that's a, a process by which you convert a series of bytes into a smaller series of bytes but it's very important in that case to make sure that your hash function, the, th the thing that does that converting, is uh, very rarely creates uh, collisions. So if you just use the ASCII codes of the uh, letters in the name, well, in that case, um, in that case, George and George in reverse, so E R G O E G will have the exact same hash and that they're going to collide on the same index. They're going to be on the same index. So creating a hash function for this is a very actually hard job. And there are people which do that very hard job and uh, compute optimal hash functions for different data types. Anyway, uh, there are data structures which allow us to do that automatically. So instead of, our, uh, instead of writing that hash function by ourselves, we can use one of the data structures, one of the associative containers in Java to do that. So now instead of having a person array, we're going to have a people map. So I'm going to create a map and this map is going to contain, of course, people, so a person, and in addition to that, it's asking me for something else. What is it asking me about? Well, well, when we began the lecture, I told you that our associative containers are going to have items which are, which consist of a key and a value. So the person is the value. The key is the index. The key is the thing by which we're going to be looking, by which we're going to be searching for a person. So in this case, we want to save people by their names because we're going to be searching by their names. So whatever you're going to be searching uh, true and you want to search with that fast search by that field fast well that's your key so that that's where the name comes from the key is what you're searching for so you you say you i want this item and you name the item by that key and then when you name the item by that key well the map knows how to search by that key so let's say that this in this case since the name is a string well the map will be a string map so a map containing strings, string keys, and each of these string keys will match to a person. So we'll have for each name, we're going to have a person object, which is indexed by that name. The same way we had for each index in an array, we had the person object, which has that age, right? So we use the age as the indexer. And here we're going to be using the string, the name as the indexer. Now I need to initialize this map with an actual implementation of a map. Just like when we're creating a list, we're actually using some specific type of list. And in most cases, we're using an array list. Well, in this case, from a map, for a map, I'm going to use the specific map type, a hash map. Now, remember when I said that what we're trying to do is achieve a hash function? Well, that's what this hash map does. 
It uses the key, in this case the string, and converts it into a number in some way. We don't really care how it does that, but it converts it, converts it into a number in some way and uses that number to quickly find um, the person which matches that number. Now it also, also has ways of handling collisions should they occur, so don't worry about that. Uh, you just need to know that if you're saving a person as, uh, if you're saving into a hash map and you're saving strings, well, that hash map will take care of hashing that those strings into numbers so it can search by index. And you don't care about what that map actually does inside. All you care about is saving items in that hash map and then looking for items in that hash map. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to say people, the same way we access the array and set place the person at index i. Well, in this case, so we had this code, place the, the person at index i. Well, in this case, we're saying people dot put, put this person, put this person. And the first thing we need to say is at which index do we need to put them? Uh, similar like how in a list you say dot set and that sets an item to some index. So you provide the index and then you provide the item. In this case, it's the same thing. You put the person at their index. What's their index? Their index is their name. So we type in name over here. And now our people map after this loop has executed will contain the people mapped by their name, indexed by their name. So indexed is a term you're, you're going to be hearing more often and more often when you're uh, developing code. So in this people map, we have now people mapped by their name. So we have at each place in this map. So this map is still a collection of elements, but the collection of elements isn't just a person element and another person element and another person element. It's a key value pair structure, which has a key, which is the string, which is the name actually, the name and that name points to a person and another name points to another person and another name points to another per person and so on and so forth. Okay, so this is what you have in this map. You have key value pairs. You have something which has a key and a value, a key and a value. And again, a key and a value, a name and a person, a key and a value. Just like in an array, you have elements and elements have indices and values. So you have the element at index something, and then you have that value at that index. However, in the map, the items themselves, the items in the array are these pairs. So if you're trying to iterate an array, you're just getting the values. But if you're iterating a map, if you're walking through all values of a map, you're getting key value pairs. We're going to discuss this in a bit. Okay, so now we have that people map, map which stores our people inside it. Now, when we read the query, instead of looping through all the items in the map, what we can do is just tell the map people, give me the person at the index of their name, right? So this is my name index. Let's call it a name. The, let's call the query a name, the thing which we're looking for. Let's just call it the name. So just like in the array, we access the array at that index, people at index age, where people was an array. In this case, we're going to access people at index name. The same way for a list, you say get and then provide an index. Well, for a map, it's get and then you provide the maps index. But in this case, the maps index is a string. OK, so what does this give you? Well, if it was a list, this would give you the element stored at that position. Well, in this case, it's exactly the same thing. You get the element, the person with that name, person with that name or just we can just call them the person, the person we're, which we're looking for, the search person or whatever. Okay, and now how do we print that person's information? We just say system.out.println person. We're looking for the name, so let's print the age, get age. Okay, so now if we start this program, and by the way, you can uh, convert this into fewer lines. So this person, we don't need a special variable for them. We can just say, uh, inline that into the print line code, but I won't for a reason and I'll show you that reason in a bit. Okay, so I got the person, I printed them on the console. So now if I enter two people, George, George of 27 years old and Peter who is 35 years old and I enter here and I ask for Peter's age, I'm going to get, what am I going to get? 35, okay? So I got 35 Peter's age. So the map looked for that person by their name, 
and then printed out their age. Okay, so that's what we got over here. We got uh, people, we got their name, and uh, actually we got a map of people. We read their names and ages. For each person, we created a person object and placed that at index name in the map. So at index, at a string index in the map. So maps work can work with any type of index. They're like arrays in which each element has an index, but that index can be an integer or a string or a double or a float or a character or whatever you want. And the map doesn't need to allocate all possible indices like the array does. So if you're having, if you're going to have two billion possible different values for age, and you're just going to be using some of them, well, the map is going to take as much space as needed for that, that, that many values, or approximately that much space. So it doesn't hog up memory the same way an array which is indexed by age does. So when I added the example of creating an array of 150 elements, but entered just two people and placed them at their ages in the array, I actually have had 148 elements which I didn't need. We don't have that issue with the map. It has close to the same amount of elements which you've put into it. It actually does uh, allocate a few uh, additional elements for collision handling and for adding new items just like the list does, but it's not um, many times, many orders of magnitude larger than the amount of items in it. It's like, say, two or three times larger than the, than the amount of items in it. <coughs> okay, so we saw how we can add items into a map, and we saw how we can search for items inside that map. Now, what happens if we get input which uh, can't be found in the map? So let's say some in, in this example, we enter instead of uh, entering Peter. So instead of entering Peter like this, let's say we enter um, Tony. But well, what we got is a no pointer exception. Why did we get a no pointer exception? Well, let's see where we got it. Okay, so I got a no pointer exception over here. Well, it couldn't have been in the system .out line code because you can print no. So it's it's got to be this expression person dot get age. Well, what does a no per, no pointer uh, no pointer exception mean? Well, it means one of these items was null, and in this case, it means that person over here was null, and we're trying to call no dot get age, and that obviously can't return anything because null is the indicator of a lack of value. So whenever a map can't find anything, it just returns null. So instead of returning an actual object, it returns a null object. So now you can check if person is different than null then print their age. Otherwise, system.out.println no such entry or no such item or no such key or no such person. Okay, so now if we start this and enter Tony like we did before, let's copy this, paste that. I copied it wrongly. Okay, never mind. Two people, George, who is 27, and Peter, who is 35. Okay, and now we enter Tony, press enter, and we got no such person. So now our program works correctly, even if the client, the person using the program, enters information which they haven't stored yet, which is expected from a, a well-implemented program. It should inform the user that they're trying to do something which can't be done. Or maybe uh, that's part of the specification of the program. So check for that person, check if there's such a person, because sometimes you just need to check the client has a database and that's why they have a database to check if a person exists in it. Okay, so this is how you store people in a map and this is how you look for them in the map. Every time you're learning about a data structure, you need to learn about four operations. So getting an item, so accessing an item by its something, then uh, putting a value inside the list or setting, put or set. So adding something to that uh, data structure. Then the other thing you need to know is how to remove something from there. And the other thing is how you can access all the elements. So how you can iterate all the elements. 
So running a for each loop, for example. So we've covered the first few. We've covered getting items and we've covered setting items, adding items to the map. Now, sometimes you can separate put and set into put and add and accessing element by their index because, for example, a list has uh, takes almost zero time to add an item at its end, but it takes a lot of time to add an item at its beginning because it needs to shift all items forward. Uh, and it takes the same time to, uh, and it takes one operation to get an item at an index, just like how an array does. Well, a hash map does, you can think of it as a single operation, meaning the, the number of uh, items in that hash map doesn't determine how fast you're looking for them with this get operation. Because again, just like with the array in which we indexed by age, here you're indexing by something and the uh, the searching operation doesn't depend on the number of items in the map. It more so depends on the number of symbols in this string in this case. So it depends on the complexity of the function which creates a, an index from a string. Okay, so but that's a bit more complicated than we need to, to uh, cover right now. All you need to know is that when you're searching for items in a map, it's relative, it's you can think of it as being the same uh, speed as searching for an item in an array. It's a bit slower, not searching, but, but accessing an item at an index of an array. So accessing the people array at position five, at index five. So that's, that's uh, when you think about large sets of data, that's comparable to how fast a map searches. So the map doesn't depend on the number of items it contains. So searching inside the map, getting an item by its index doesn't depend on the item the maps con the items the map contains just like in an array so accessing an item at index 500 or 5 is the same and doesn't matter whether the array is 5 billion elements or 3 elements or 1 element or 100 elements and so on okay so this is a fast operation for a map looking for something by its index by its key okay and that gives you the value started that key. Now, some of you might have noticed that instead of having a person object over here, we can just have a map containing strings and integers, right? So since we're going to be storing uh, people, uh, names of people and ages of people, we don't really need the person object. Although often in programming, what you're going to have is exactly this, a data structure in which you have some type of identity, something by which you're going to be searching and objects ordered by that identity, so indexed by that identity. But for this task, if we want to avoid creating an object, now we can do that by just saying that this people map gets an integer over here. And now instead of saving a person object, we can just save the age. And now instead of getting a person object, we're going to get, and here it's important that we get an integer with capital letters. Why are we getting an integer with, with capital letters? Well, because the integer with capital letters is something which can be no. So if you're searching, imagine that you had a normal integer over here and you had int here. Well, if you're getting that uh, int from the people table, well, what happens if that people, uh, that people map doesn't contain that integer? What, what happens if there's no such uh, name index which we're searching for in this map. Well, what it, what is it going to do? It can't tell you the result is zero because there could be a person with age zero. So that's not correct. So what happens it's, is the map returns no. And if you try to save it directly into a small integer like this one, you're going to get an exception. You're going to get a failure, a no pointer exception telling you that it can't convert from, can't convert from no to the small integer type. So that's why here we use the large integer type. When when a result can be no, when a result when it's possible for a result not to be found, then we use the capital case for the capital uh, type. This is the boxing type, the so-called box type, the wrapper type of the normal integer value. And this boxing type has uh, the ability to be no. This is an object, whereas the int uh, type just is just a primitive variable. Okay, so now we do the same checks. We check if the age is uh, something different than no, and if it is, then we have found a person and we print its integer value. 
the integer value of the age in this case. Otherwise, we print again no such person. So this code is going to do the exact same thing, but without using a person class. Now, again, most commonly in programming in the industry, what you're going to see is collections of data and most of the data in the industry is objects. So persons, students, cars, whatever you have in your business logic and those things saved by some indices and often saved by a lot of indices. For example, you could have a map of strings indexing and indexing the people by their names and then another map of integers indexing the people by their age. So let's say that you have uh, a database which needs to search for people quickly based on their age or their name. And in that case, well, you just check in both maps, see if that uh, input is valid in one of the maps and return that if it is. And otherwise, search in the other map and see if that's valid. So that's an idea for a bonus homework task. Try to implement this task in which you read something, you, you read a string and then check if that's a name of a person, you know, search for the peop search for a person in this map of people. And then if it isn't, check if it's an age of a person, meaning convert that into an integer and search into another map which contains integers. That again is very fast. So you're doing one operation to look in the string map and then one operation to look in the integer map. Whereas if they were arrays or lists, you need to loop, loop once through all of the elements and that those are n operations to find the element you need. And since you're checking for two things, that's n multiplied by two. Whereas in our case, it's just one operation for one thing, one operation for the other thing, and that's it. Granted, they are a bit slower operations than just checking for equality in a loop. But still, when there are n items, which can be 10 or 100 or 1,000 or 100,000, well, then it starts re it's really starts to matter how you're storing your information and how you're looking for it. And again, the maps are not affected by how many items there are. They are just affected by how difficult it is to convert the string, the thing you're looking for into an index, meaning how complex the, the hash function is. Okay, so we discussed associative arrays actually. So that's, now let's see them formally. So associative arrays or maps or dictionaries or tables, there are a lot of uh, different ways you can name them. The most often is probably map, dictionary and table. Okay, so these are things indexed by keys. So arrays are indexed by integers 0, 1, 2 and so on until you reach length minus 1. Whereas maps are indexed by their keys and each map holds a sequence, a list actually, of keys and values. So each item in a map is a key value pair. Okay, and how do you work with them? <coughs> how do they look in the in memory? Well, they look the following. The, they're represented in the following way. You have keys in the table or the map or the dictionary or whatever you like to call it. You have a key in the map, and then you have a value for that map. And each item in the map contains both a key and a value. So these are the items in the maps which I am outlining right now. So these are the items in the maps, and it is. Uh, it is the, the operation of searching for an ind so for something in the map uh, by its key is fast. It immediately finds that index. For example, if you're looking for Sam Doe, that's going to be one operation to find Sam Doe in the index. Whereas if it was just a list, you'd need to search and check this one and then this one and then this one. That's, those are three operations. Okay, so there are Three different, three different types of maps which are most commonly used in uh, Java. One of them is a hash map, the one we just use. Keys in this hash map are unique. You can't have, and that actually um, is applied for all of the maps which we're talking about. So keys being unique means that you can't have, in our case, two people with the same name. So you can't have both uh, George of 27 and George of 35 and George of 42. Each time you put a new value into the map, you override the old one at that index, the same way you do for an array. So in an array, you can't have multiple um, multiple values at the same index. You can have a single value at that index. Well, you can work that around by using a list of values, by having an array in, in which each of the elements is a list of values, and you can do the same in the map actually. Okay, so about that a bit further on. Okay, so 
that's the hash map unique values and it uses a hash table to store the information so the the hash table is what i told you the hash map does it calculates an integer from the key you're providing it and places the object in that index in an internal array it uses okay so it, it's nothing special with just uh, a, a map of values okay the linked hash map is a bit of uh, an upgrade over the normal hash map in that it keeps its keys in the order of addition, meaning that if you iterate through a linked hash map, you're going to get the items in the order in which you added them. Whereas if you're iterating a normal hash map, you have no guarantees of order. So they can be ordered in any possible way. And they could even change their order between different iterations. That doesn't really happen with the standard hash maps, but it's not a, something that it's guaranteed. So whenever you have a hash map you can't expect this hash map to be ordered in any understandable way okay and the last thing which is a bit different is the tree map again you have unique keys inside the tree map however the tree map expects its keys to be comparable so it expects keys to be for example strings integers stuff that you can sort if you can sort them with collections.sort that means that they can be used inside the tree map as a key. Now, what's the uh, advantage of the tree map? Well, it always keeps its elements sorted by their keys. So if you're going, if we switch over here to a tree map, so if we say that this map is not a hash map, but it's a tree map, then this tree map, we need to import it, of course. This tree map, uh, is going to contain the people in their order, in their alph alphabetical order. So if I enter George, then Ada, then Peter, we're going to have the items ordered as Ada, George, Peter, because that's the alphabetical order of those names. Okay, we'll see that in a bit. So that those are the differences. I told you about the put method. It just places an item at some index in the map. Okay, now what I didn't tell you about is the remove method. Now the remove method operates on the same parameters as the get method. So the get method returns the value, whereas the remove method removes the value. So now if we have this, uh, and by the way, the remove method, the put method, the get method uh, are all, uh, they work for any type of map. So it's, it's common for all maps. Now notice how I'm using this just map name here so the data type is map and i'm instantiating it with an hash map object that means that if i'm accessing people now i'm only accessing the methods which the map class has the base class has so these are the common methods which all maps have so since i'm since i can do get on this map i can do it on any map which is assignable to a map over here so any tree map link hash map whatever they all have a get they all have a uh, they all have a put they all have a remove okay so if now i add uh, to these people if i say people dot put and i put george uh, with the age of 27 and then if i put peter with the age of 35 so i don't have to enter it all the time and then i say people dot remove and then say remove Peter, then in my map, all I'm going to have left is George. So now if I start this program and I inspect this map, I'm waiting. Oh, I have a scanner.nextint over here. I don't really need that. That's why my code is waiting and not stopping at my breakpoint. So now it's going to go over these lines, reach over here and now notice people size is one, but I added two, two people in this. Why, why is the size one? Well, because I removed Peter. I removed by an index, the index Peter. Okay. So now I can examine this map over here in the variables view. And I can see that <clears throat> the first item in that variables view is George and they, that George has a value of 27 attached to it. <clears throat> okay. Now, if I didn't remove Peter, if I didn't have this line, then I'd have both of them in the map. So let's wait a bit to see that. <clears throat> okay, so I have these people over, over here and I have George with the value of 27 and Peter with the value of 35. Okay, so that's what the hash map does. It can remove elements and can it can add elements. And now what we haven't seen yet is how we can iterate these elements. Okay, oh, uh, there are also a few methods which 
give you boolean results for example contains key answers the question whether getting an item will, would result in no right so if i say uh people with this data people don't get ada that's going to give me what result so that's not a person actually since we're saving integers in our case so an integer add a h because that's what we're saving over here in this map that's why i'm telling it that uh, that's why i'm naming it add a h or just maybe h since that's i'm getting ada and that's the h for ada anyway so if I'm getting Ada right now, what I get for H would be no, right? So if I start the debugger again and see what inspect this value, I'm going to get no. Well, if you say people.contains key H, that's going to return a Boolean value. Boolean uh, contains key Ada. Okay, so has h for ada equals people dot contains key ada what does this do well it does a get operation and then checks whether the result of that operation is null so this is the same as saying has h for ada equals people dot get ada different than null so is this value different than null so contains key is just a short shorthand for this operation okay and there's also contains value which checks for a value now, now i really don't advise you to use this why well contains value is just as slow as looking for in a list because that's what it does because the items over here are ordered by their index so th this is the index so searching by the index is fast whereas whereas searching by the value just requires you to go through all of the items in the map and check if that value is there so this is a slow operation do it only if you really need to do that slow operation okay so this ch this thing checks the values it doesn't check uh, the keys okay and now we have an illustration of how this operation works. So what happens is the object you're adding goes through the hash function. More, uh, more specifically, its key goes through the hash function and then gets placed somewhere in that map. And if you add another object, it gets into the, that map again. Now, if, you're, if you say remove, you just provide the key which you want to remove. And that key is found in the map and that map uh, is uh, reduced by that key. The, the key and the value for that key are removed. Okay, now a tree map works differently in that it can, instead of running things through a hash function, it runs them through a comparator. So once you're adding items, that comparator checks which item, which key should be before which key and moves items around so that they are always ordered. Okay, so how can we see that order? Well, we need to iterate through the maps. So you can iterate through maps, let's say this map, which is initialized over here, or the map, which we initialized over here with George, Peter and Ada. That's actually put in Ada too. So people dot put Ada, which is, let's say 21. Okay. And now what can we do over here? Well, we can iterate this map. Okay, so how do we iterate the loop? Uh, how do we iterate um, a list? We just type in the name of the list and then we say iterate. Um, so we implement a range-based for loop uh, for each loop on that list. How do we do that for a map? Well, the map has a special property, a special getter called entry set. So this is this returns all the entries inside a map. So these are all the items inside the map and you call iterate on this. So you iterate these values. So you type in entry set and then you type in, uh, let's remove the breakpoint so that it doesn't uh, make, make things weird. So you say iterate and what did we get? We, get, we got an auto generated for each loop, which gets each time a map.entry, an entry containing a string and an integer. Okay, and it named it ent string integer entry. I would just call it entry. Okay, and now how do I print the values? Well, let's just say system.out.println. And what did we say that the entry contains? Let's use actually print f because we're going to print formatted information. So one thing we're going to be printing is the key of the entry. And the other thing which we we're going to be printing is the value of the entry, which in this case is an integer. So a string and a number. Okay, so what are those string and number? How can we get them from this entry? Well, we already said that e everything in a map is just a pair of a key and a value. So this entry is actually an object 
in, on which I can say dot get key. I can type in dot get key and that gives me the key. So for the first entry George, get key will return George. And for the first entry George, entry dot get value will return 27. So if I start this loop, I will see George, Peter and Ada printed out onto the console in some order. I actually should have added a new line over here so it's a bit more clearer to read. So starting this code, let's print this out. So George, Peter and Ada. Now they are ordered in the way I added them, but this isn't something you can rely on. In this case, that's how they're ordered. In another case, they could be ordered in some different way. So the normal hash map, you can't expect them to be ordered in the order of, ad of addition. Now, if you use a linked hash map, that guarantees that these are going to be in this order. So they're going to be in the order in which you added them to the linked hash map. And the other operations, operations are exactly the same. Nothing else changes, just the internal operations inside this, that, inter, that linked hash map change. Okay, so that's how you uh, iterate a map. Now, if I change this into a tree map and notice that I'm not changing anything else, I'm just changing the internal implementation of a map. I'm just telling it to internally work in a different way. But my put operations, my get operations, and so on, my iterations are implemented in the same way. Now, if I run it, I'm going to see add a first. Why? Well, because add a key is first alphabetically, and this tree map compares items alphabetically if they're strings, or it compares them numerically if they're integers. Okay, so this is how you iterate a map. This is, this is how you get each of the entries inside that map. And each of those entries has a key and a value. The key is what you index by, and the value is whatever you put after that. Okay, so that's iteration on a map, and here's another example of doing that. Okay, so we have a problem over here, and let's solve that problem. We have a list of real numbers, and we need to print them in ascending order. Okay, so that should indicate something to you. Okay, so a list of real numbers, and we need to count their occurrences. So we have 8, 2, 2, 8, 2. So we have 2 3 times, and we have 8 2 times. Okay, so what do we do? Well, if we're following along with the lesson up until this point, we're probably going to figure out that this is going to be a task about maps, right? So how do you solve that? Well, we're going to be using a map. And since they're going to be in ascending order, and since we're printing them like this, so we're saying 2 is encountered 3 times and 8 is encountered 2 times, <clears throat> what does that indicate to you? Well, it indicates that we're iterating through values of a map. And since we're iterating in increasing order, so 2 then 8, that's what kind of map? What kind of map iterates its items in increasing order? Well, the uh, tree map does that. Okay, and what we're going to be doing? Well, we're going to read an item, read a number, and then see what that number's value is, and then just go to the map and increase the count of that value. So we're going to be mapping the following thing. We're going to be mapping numbers to occurrences. So for each number, we, we're going to be counting how many times it appears. It's pretty much the same as if we were, we were reading words, 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 and we're mapping word to the to the number of the, of the occurrences of that word, to the count of that word inside uh, the text, for example. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's do it. We need, what do we need? Well, we need to order these, order these items in ascending order, so we're going to need numbers, so, and we're going to be reading them from a single line on the console. So let's read numbers from a single line on the console. We've already done that a lot of times. So we have a scanner, we're going to tell that scanner to read an entire line, then split that line by spaces, and then get that line as a list of items. So actually an array of items. So this is the string array um, item. Let's call it items because they're not exactly numbers since they're not converted to numbers yet. Okay, and now for each item, I need to visit that item and convert it into an integer. So I'd start 
I type in items, I iterate those items, and I'd say for each item, convert that into a number. How? Well, I'm going to use integer dot parse int and enter that item. Okay, so parsing that integer into a number, and then that number, I'm going to what? I need to count how many times this number appears. So this number is actually my identity thing. This is this is what I'm going to be looking for when I'm doing my operations. So what I'll do is make a map, <clears throat> tell that map that it's going to contain integers and integers again. I can do that. It's perfectly fine for the key to be the same as the value, at least for their data types to be the same. Okay, and now I'm counting number occurrences, the number of times a number is seen in the input. And I'm going to initialize that since we're needing ascending order. I'm going to initialize that with a tree map. Okay, so I'm going to be looking for the occurrences of each number by initializing a tree map. And then once I have a number, what, uh, what am I going to do? Well, if I haven't encountered it yet, if it's the first time I'm, I'm finding this number, if, I, if it's the first time I'm seeing this number, then I'm going to place it inside number occurrences as that number with the value one. So what I'm saying here is get number occurrences and put at position number the value one, just as if it was an array. I'm increasing the value at that index by one. I'm setting it to one the first time. Now, if I just leave it like this, every number I encounter is going to have the value one next to it. But I don't want that. I want, if I see it for the first time, I want it to be to become one. But if, if I see it a second time, so like over here, if I say eight for the first time, then I'm going to, in my map, go over here and say, okay, eight, say that this is one time. Now, I see two. Okay, so two, we mark it as one time. But then I see two again. And now what do I want to do? Well, I want to check if two exists in the map. So does two exist? And the answer is yes. And if two exists, well, change its value to the value two, increase its value by one, because I've encountered it another time. I do the same for eight. And then again, for two, I check, okay, does two exist? Yeah, it does. So since it exists, increase that by one again. So this is going to become three. And meanwhile, eight would have become two. So the number of occurrences for eight would have become two. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, obviously, I need to check if the number exists. And I need to do that every time because I don't know if the I don't know at which number I am. So I just check all the time I check, does that number exist? So I say, if and how am I, how am I going to do that? I could use contains key. But since I'm in going to be increasing it, if I find it anyway, I'm going to do this, the following, I'm going to create an integer and call that integer um, occurrences. The number of occurrences is occurrences written with double R or not. Okay, it doesn't matter. So occurrences equals what? Where do I get the occurrences of the current number? Well, I get it from number occurrences dot get number. So give me the occurrences, the count of that number. How many times have I seen this number? Now, if I haven't seen it yet, then occurrences is going to be what? What do we get when we get a key so so when we get a value from a by a key and if that key hasn't yet been added to the map what do we get well we get no so if we get no if occurrences is no then we need to place the number one because we obvi obviously haven't met this number yet so we're adding it as a single occurrence Otherwise, if occurrences isn't no, so occurrences is an actual value, then we found this item already. Now, how many times it doesn't matter, since once we found it one more time, what needs to happen with occurrences? Well, it needs to get increased by one. And it needs to get written back into the map. So I'm going to say set at position number, at position number, set the value occurrences plus one, right? So this, I know that this is different than no. And since it's different than now, I can increase it by one. I can calculate this plus one and place that result inside number occurrences. Now, since this is simply an integer, I can't change the value itself inside the map. I need to place a new value in the map. Remember, integers can't be modified directly uh, 
when you have a reference to them. So when you have this integer occurrences, you can't modify it inside the map. This is you can think of it as a copy of the actual value over here. Whereas if it was a person, you could, for example, change their age or something. Okay, so this is going to increase increase the number of occurrences of this value by one inside our map. Okay. Anything else we need to do? Well, we need to print these items. Okay, so we need to say items iterate. Uh, not the items, but the well, we already are iterating the items. What do we need to iterate? Well, we need to iterate the occurrences. So we need to say number occurrences, give me the entry set, and then iterate that. And this I'll just call entry. And now what I need to do is simply print this format. So how do I get this format? Well, let's copy this value and say system.out.printf. Print me a formatted line, end it with a new line. And what should that formatted line contain? Well, one number, then space dash uh, greater than dash the other number. So uh, num number, uh, space, arrow, space, the other number. Okay, so I can just copy it actually. Number, space, the arrow, and then the other number. And now I just replace these uh, specific numbers with whatever numbers I'm going to be getting from the format string. So what should I get from the, the format string? Well, the first, the key is the number itself. What number am I counting the occurrences of? So entry.getKey gives me the number itself, the thing by which I'm indexing. And then entry.getValue gives me the value itself, the, the value by which I'm, uh, the value which I've stored at this index. So when I start this program, what I'm going to get is a program which reads in numbers, adds them into the tree map, uh, first checks, gets the number at that index. So it reads a number, it gets the occurrences of that number, the count of that number, the, the times I've met this number in the input, gets those times. If there are there is there if there is no such entry for this number, if there are there are zero occurrences, then I'm going to get no because the map couldn't find my number because I haven't added it. Okay? And I just put it back with a value of one. If there are occurrences already, so if I'm counting up something already, well then I just increase the number of occurrences by one and put it back into that number position. So I overwrite this position with occurrences plus one. Okay, so now if I uh, enter my data over here, I should see two is encountered three times and eight is encountered two times. Now, why did I get them ordered two and then eight? Well, I got them ordered that way because I'm using a tree map. If I was using a hash map, I'd get a random order. If I was using a linked hash map, I'd get eight and then two, because that's the order in which I'm creating them. Okay, so this is how you count the number of occurrences of things in some input. Now you can do it for any type of input. If these were instead of uh, numbers, if they were words, well, the code is exactly the same, only you wouldn't be parsing them into integers, you would just be using the strings here in items. So it's the same code and the map would be keyed by string instead of keyed by integer. And that's it. Those are pretty much all the changes you need. Okay, so here we have a solution to this. Again, there are different ways you can solve this. Uh, the slides suggest the usage of contains key. The reason I'm avoiding contains key, even though it's a bit more uh, descriptive of what we're doing, is that contains key needs to do one search and then we need to do another search. Okay. So we then overwrite the value with the new. Um, now there are some uh, details over here. The numbers aren't actually uh, integers like I'm doing in my solution. So I'm using integers over here. You should be using doubles for this task. So the task is called count real numbers and you should print them with some accuracy. So you have real numbers over here instead of just integers. But as I said, it doesn't really matter what data type you're storing, the map works the same way. So the map works both for double, for string, for integer, for whatever you wish. Okay, so we've talked about uh, maps, we've uh, showed you how you can use them, and now since we've discussed that already, let's continue on with the next part of the, le uh, of the lesson. In programming, 
what you're going to see uh, when you see a lambda function, what, you, what it usually means is a shorthand expression, a shorter expression that gives some kind of result, although it's not uh, always necessary for it to return a result in uh, programming. So a shorthand for a function uh, expression. So instead of writing an entire function, you just write an expression which is treated as a function. So what you do is use this arrow operator over here in Java, which you read as goes to. So on the left of that goes to operator, you have the parameters of that lambda, whereas on the right of that goes to operator, you have the method body of that lambda. So instead of writing a function which accepts for example an integer parameter a and then returns whether a is larger than five or not you can just write that like this like this code over here okay so let's uh um let's actually see that before we start seeing it in uh more in the in the further in the slides further on so instead of let's uh, go back to this code over here um say you want to uh, what can we do something more simple well okay let, let's uh, describe the concept itself so when you write a lambda it's so let's say you have the function boolean um r ordered correctly so the static boolean function the static boolean method are ordered correctly is going to accept a few parameters let's say two parameters and it's going to respond whether these two parameters are ordered correctly meaning that it's going to respond whether the number a is smaller than the number b so it's going to return whether a is less than b so are ordered correctly will return the value whether a is less than b in this uh, in, in its operation so if I say r ordered correctly 4 and 5 then this is going to return true whereas instead instead if it was 5 and 4 it's going to return false so doing this operation will um, will, will execute the this line of code and that's going to return a boolean now instead of me writing this entire uh, method polluting the global namespace, not the global, but the main namespace with it. So main now has a method which isn't really used in other places than this specific uh, place over here. Uh, instead of doing all this, instead of writing all this code, what I can do in places where stuff like a function returning a boolean accepting two variables uh, is required, is I can replace this entire piece of code with a comma b meaning the parameters a and b go into uh, a less than b so this is a shorthand now it won't compile like this uh, if i write it over here even if i do it like this it's not going to create a function and execute it and so on although if i say boolean x equals no still can't make it do it so the point is these whatever what I wrote over here is a shorthand for writing a function that accepts two parameters of any type in this case accepts two parameters of some type and then returns the result of comparing the first parameter to the second parameter okay so this is a lambda a lambda is a shorthand for a function and there are specific places in which you use lambdas so for example in collections.sort so if you have, let's say we have um, a list of integers and we call these numbers and we initialize them with a new array list and fill that array list with an array treated as a list containing the values 4, 1, 3, and 2. Okay, so now what I can do is tell collections dot sort this numbers list okay so what this does is compares the numbers according to the natural order of these numbers sorts them out and let's say we're going to print them now on the console let's run a loop over them and for each number in numbers i'm just going to say system.out.print 
line that number. And now we see these numbers ordered as one, two, three, and four on separate lines on the console printed after this sort operation completes. Now some of my code is formatted badly, so I just pressed Control Alt and L and L to format it correctly. Okay, so this is a sorting operation and it sorts the numbers over here. Now, how does it know which number to place where? So how does it decide whether uh, one should be before four or after four? Well, it does it by using a comparator. So the second parameter over here of the collections.sort method is a comparator. What does a comparator do? Well, it compares two values, obviously. Now, if you start typing in new and press uh, control and space, you'd get the suggestion for implementing a comparator function. So what does a comparator function do? Well, it simply uh, returns an integer value, which is the result of comparing two existing integers. So now this code over here might seem a bit weird, it probably does, but it's just a way for sort to call something and to ask it whether O1 is less than O2. And how do you do that? Well, you just say O1 compared to O2. Compared to actually returns an integer value, which if the two numbers are equal, the integer value is zero. And if they are not equal, the integer, if the first one is smaller than the second one, the integer value is larger than or smaller than zero. So it returns actually three possible values, either a value smaller than zero or a value equal to zero or a value larger than zero, depending on whether O1 is larger than O2 or the opposite is true. Okay, so it doesn't really matter when it returns minus one or minus two and so on, and when it returns plus one and plus two and so on. All that matters is that you can use the compare to function to order numbers in their natural order. So if you say compare O1 to O2 like this, so when you need to compare two numbers inside these, this numbers uh, list to order them, just compare them as you would compare the first number to the second number because each object in each comparable object in Java has a compare to method. Then this will sort the numbers in this order in which O1 comes before our O2. So whatever order you uh, call the object, uh, call the method and provide a parameter in. So if you call the method on the first object and provide the second object as a parameter, then sort, we will try to order O1 and O2, we'll try to order objects such that the smaller item is before the larger item. So when you accept parameters like this, the first item is expected to be smaller and if it isn't sort will do something to change that order and the second parameter is expected to be larger so if you say return o1 compared to o2 this will return a result which will tell the sort function whether it should swap these values around or whether it shouldn't that's a sort of a simplistic explanation of what a comparator does it's just used by sort to determine whether these two numbers are in the correct order like like this and if you say that you want these two numbers to be in this order with this code then they are going to be in this order now if you swap these around o2 and o1 then you're going to tell the sort function that these two numbers should be ordered so that o2 become comes before o1 okay so that's a comparator function and now you can see that this it's not actually a function it's a comparator object and now you can see that this is a lot of code so this is a large piece of code which really comes down to just one expression we have the parameter o1 and the parameter o2 and we need to do something with them we need to compare one to the other now instead of writing this whole code i can minimize this with the lambda and say that o1 and o2 the parameters which i got need to uh, Using them, I need to evaluate this expression, compare the second to the first, meaning that now sorting the numbers will sort them by uh, in reverse order. So when I start this, I'm going to get 4, 3, 2, 1 printed on the console. Okay, so here we have 4, 3, 2, 1 printed on the console. So a lambda is just a shorthand for a function. Instead of writing an entire function, for instead of writing an entire method, you just write the part of that method which matters to whoever is going to be using that method. So in this case, you're telling sort, how do I compare two numbers? Well, 
these two numbers need to be in this order only if uh, this comparison returns a, a result that is appropriate for that case. Now, if you want to play around with what that result really means, you can just do um, integer dot compare one and two and see what it prints out. So let's say system dot out dot print line compare one with two and see what that prints out. And that's going to print out an integer which is either smaller than or greater than zero because one and two aren't equal. So what did we get? Minus one. Well, guess what integer dot compare does and that's the same thing that compare two does. Well, it subtracts this no the second number from the first number. And if it gets a negative value, if sort sees a negative value, then it says, says, okay, these two need to be in this order. Otherwise, it decides that it needs to swap them if the, if the value is positive. So now if I compare um, seven to two, guess what's going to, guess what you're going to get as a result? Well, let's see it. We got one, a number larger than uh, zero. So it subtracted seven and, and two, it got a number larger than zero and it returned one. So it returns one, one in when the first is larger than the second. And again, you can think of it like subtraction. So compare is just like add a minus over here and see whether the value is positive or negative. That's what it does. If it's a positive value, then it's going to return one. If it's a negative value, it's going to return minus one. And if they are equal, so seven and seven, what is this going to do? Well, seven minus seven is zero. So that's what you're going to get from compare. So what does sort do? Well, it checks whether it got a negative value. So if you see, if, if it checks two numbers, so if, if it comes over here and says four and one, and compares them what if it gets a negative value so if it gets a negative value it's going to say okay they are correctly ordered but since in this case it's not going to get uh, minus one it's going to get one because four minus one is three that's a positive value so it's going to get one then it's going to swap them around so it's going to swap around one and four it's not exactly going to do that but it's going to know that these two values aren't ordered correctly and it's going to need to find a way to order them, order them correctly. So that's what sort does. It just accepts a comparator information which, which tells it how to compare. Now, since we've provided it the other way around over here, so it gets four and one, it gets four and one over here, but we're comparing one with four, it's going to decide, okay, so these are the, in the correct order. So four is before one, and that's what I'm getting from this compare function, from this compare lambda. Then I'll keep them ordered that way. Well, of course, there could be more items inside over here. So it's going to continue and swap around until it reaches uh, a situation in which all items uh, get a minus one when compared like this. But you get the point. It, it just executes this operation to decide whether to swap, swap around two numbers or not, whether two numbers order is correct or whether it isn't correct. Okay. So instead of writing the, that entire long function, which you saw previously, you can just write that like so. So this is a Lambda function and Lambda functions are made to be provided as parameters to other functions and you and be used to describe what those other functions should do uh, in their operations. OK, so that's what a Lambda function is. And for example, this lambda function is the equivalent of a function that returns an integer, accepts an integer, like a single integer, and it returns a single integer by dividing it by two. This is another lambda function, which guess what? Re accepts an integer and returns, what's this operation? A Boolean. So depending on the expression type, well, that's what function gets generated. That's what method gets generated. And here's another example of a lambda. This lambda accepts no parameters. If you want to accept no parameters, you just type in empty brackets and that means no parameters. If you want multiple parameters, you type in brackets and you enumerate those parameters with commas. And if you want a single parameter, you can still put, place it inside uh, brackets, but uh, it's preferable you just use that parameter name. Okay, so this is a function that always returns 42. And that's all you need to know about lambdas for now, further on in uh, other lessons, we will see uh, more advanced usages of lambdas. But before we see that, we're going to talk about the Stream API. Now, the Stream API is a special API added to Java, which allows you to do operations like this. Instead, and we've seen them already 
uh, short uh, for a brief example but now we're going to study what she, what each of those examples actually does and see what how we can use them to improve our code writing okay so what does the stream API do? Well, it handles collections of elements, whether they are arrays or lists or maps or whatever, collections of elements and does operations on them instead of you having to uh, do operations yourself. So, for example, what this code would do is find the minimum value of this, arrays of, of this array of integers and return it as an integer which you can use instead of writing a for loop that search for the minimum searches for the minimum value so what's actually important about these uh, streams well um, java 8 added the streams library so you can use streams not just to shorten the way you write code because that's not the that's not usually something you uh, care about too much when you're coding what you're coding is not how fast you're coding what you care about is how fast you can read code that's already been written that's Code gets written usually once, but it gets read a lot of times before it gets re rewritten. So the Streams API isn't just a shortcut for creating uh, short code. The main reason it was actually added was to um, allow easier coding of parallel operations. So uh, modern computers have a lot of uh, CPUs, a lot of cores, and these cores do can do different operations. So uh, working on large chunks of data is actually more optimal if you split those large chunks of data into specific operations which need to be parallelized by the processors so the stream api is the the reason it exists is mostly to parallelize operations however we're not going to be using it for parallelizing operations what we're going to be using it for is just doing one-liners, one-line uh, operations on lists and arrays instead of having to write uh, loops with indices and for each loops to operate on our data. Now, that in no way does that mean that uh, you should not use for loops for uh, simple operations when you need to process data. Actually, it's it's sort of preferable to use for loops instead of using the stream API when it's clear enough what your code does so if you're if, if you've structured your code into methods each of those methods has an appropriate name and that name indicates what that method does and that method uh, is called and then provided as a parameter to another method and so on that's completely fine and you don't need to use the stream api if you write your code like that now it's still a nice tool to have at your disposal so we're going to see how we can use them but again my advice is don't overuse this stuff it, re it could really allow you to write very difficult to read code so don't overuse it use it just for one-liners that uh, are going to save you time from writing loops which you've written a hundred times already so without further ado let's discuss what streams are now there are two Let's call them two types of streams. One type of streams works on arrays. Another type of streams works on collections like lists, um, um, maps, and so on. Now, they aren't really two different types, but working, working with arrays, especially arrays of primitive values, is a bit different. You remember that if you're creating a list, that list needs to be of capital case integer, whereas if you're creating an array, it can be an array of uh, lowercase integer or capital case integer so this other th the second type of array this lowercase integer this primitive integer is the it's sort of the odd one out it, it doesn't really match with uh, java's way of uh, using collections so these primitive arrays which we create over here uh, need some special handling when you're using the stream api so you're going to see differences of uh, how we're using the stream API based on whether we're uh, streaming over a list or we're streaming over an array. So that those are the two different uh, categories of stream API operations you're going to be doing. Okay, so what does a stream do? A stream simply uh, operates on a bunch of data with shorthand operations and it does that lazily, meaning that it only does the actual operations when it gets to a so-called uh, finalizer or terminator uh, stream operation. So min, for example, is a terminator stream operation. Why is it a terminator operation? Because 
in order to get the minimum value, you actually have to traverse the values inside the stream and get a result. And after you get the minimum value, you can't convert that back into a stream because the minimum minimum value is just the minimum value. Whereas if you're doing filtering, for example, if you're removing any number that's say not uh, an even number, that operation will not be executed until you reach a terminating operation like for example min. So let's actually play around with that. So let's get rid of these numbers and then just create an array and play around with that. So let's create an array. So let's create an integer array and call it numbers and initialize it with the numbers, let's say one, two, three, and four. Okay, so we have an integer array of numbers. Now let's say I want to, hmm, don't know, what do I want to do with this uh, array? Well, let's say I want to leave in only the elements, I want to get only the elements which are even. So how do I do that? Well, one option is to write a for loop. So let's say numbers, iterate the numbers and check if number percent two equals zero. The end, for example, print that number. So say system dot out dot print line that number. So print only the even numbers. Okay. So what can I do instead of writing this for loop? Well, I can create a stream from these numbers. Now, since they're an integer array, a special a primitive type integer array, I need the special construction of streams, meaning I need to say arrays, please construct a stream from these numbers, from these numbers over here. And then what can I do from here on out? Well, I want only the numbers which are divisible by two and one of the intermediate operations on a stream is filtering. So now I can say filter these numbers. And how do I want to filter them? Well, how do I tell uh, a stream to execute a piece of code? So how would, does the decide which number to keep and which number not to keep? So how can what do I need to write over here? What am I writing in the for loop? Well, I'm writing an expression, right? So this is an expression. Well, I can't really copy this expression directly over here because what's number over here? But what I can do is, so this is a piece of code, a piece of code that accepts what's this? It's a parameter, right? So this is actually a method. This is a method which I can extract uh, as a, a static method and call it is even, right? So if the number is even, then I'm going to process it. Okay, so this is actually a method. Well, what I can say over here is provide the is even method, though I need to say main uh, double, uh, double column is even. Now what I'm doing is telling filter to use this is even method to filter out numbers. So this code over here will have the, the same effective result for uh, our data which we've initialized, the same effective result as this code over here except uh, the printing part. So this will, after this filter operation completes, anything I get after that filter operation is only going to contain the even numbers inside this array. Okay, so it's not even an array anymore, so we've created a stream from these numbers and now this is a stream. This stream is independent from the array, from the array itself. So this is a new piece of data on which I'm working. So I'm filtering out the numbers from this new stream object which I've created. And now I'm saying, okay, I want this uh, number, this stream which I've created to only uh, re to only leave in elements which are which match this expression. Now this might be a bit confusing, so I'll roll it back to what we did a few moments ago, which was use a lambda expression. So how would I do this as a lambda expression? Let's return the is even method. Let's uh, return the expression. So now I have an expression, right? So how do I give an expression to a method to use. Well, I provide a lambda. So here's the expression. It's the same expression. However, I just need to say, okay, so this is a lambda which receives a number parameter and it returns whether that number parameter is an even number. So filter 
expects me to provide the lambda over here the same way that collections.sort expect me to provide a second parameter actually i can do it without a second parameter but if i do provide a second parameter that second parameter ex is expected to be a lambda which describes how in the in the case of collections.sort it describes how to compare two numbers in filter it describes whether a number should remain in the stream. So if this expression returns true, then this number for which filter is being called at this point, so once, fil so once filter is going to be called for one, so number is going to be one, and the result will be what? It will be false, right? Because 1% 2 equals one. So the remainder of one divided by two is one, so that's not equal to zero, so that, that's not going to uh, be included in the result. So one is, skipped then i'm going to get two okay so two goes into two percent two equals zero well yes it does equal zero so this is going to be included then i'm going to get three so three percent two equals zero well that's false so this isn't going to be included and then i'm going to get four so number is going to be four four percent two is zero so this is going to be included so from here on out any operation i chain up over here is going to work over that uh, remaining sequence of two and four, which I got remain, which I got. Okay, so I need to do something about this at some point. So let's say I want to find the minimum even number from this list instead of printing them all. Actually, let's print them all first. So I can convert this. Now this is a stream. If I create a variable, let's call it x that variable will be created as a stream more specifically as an int stream Int streams uh instead what's the difference between just a stream and an int stream well int stream and double stream and float stream and so on are streams specifically designed for working with this primitive type array so if it's a list of integers then it's going to just be a stream but if it's an integer array it's going to be an int stream and int streams have some special functionality which is uh, specific to these primitive data types okay so an int stream and how do i print this int stream well i need to collect this int stream so a stream is just a sequence of values and those values aren't calculated until someone needs them so when i write this code nothing will actually happen so none of these operations will actually execute so this filter operation will not execute these numbers will not be filtered because nobody has asked for the data in order or no, in order for me to ask for the data and now look i'm going to add a breakpoint whoops add a breakpoint over here and it's going to ask me whether i want the breakpoint to be added inside the lambda or on the line and i'm going to say add it inside the lambda and now when I start this code, you're going to notice that this lambda will not execute, even though I've added a breakpoint in it. Look, I directly got onto the for loop, even though this filter operation is written before my for loop. Okay, so let's stop it and let's make it, uh, let's write it out again. Now, lambdas, you can uh, type in on several different lines. So instead of writing a single line like this, you can make it look more like a method, add a method body and place a return, return statement and pray, press a semicolon after that. So notice that uh, this is already looking a lot like a method, only that this method doesn't mention its uh, parameter data types, but it still has a return, it still has a body, you can have as many functions here as you like. So let's place another breakpoint over here so you notice that this breakpoint is inside this method over here. But again, notice that this method will not be executed because nobody has asked for the data inside this int stream. We directly jumped onto the printing over here. Okay, so this code is not executed unless someone asks for it. So let's ask for it. What I'm going to do is say x dot, so this is my stream, x dot min. This is going to give me the minimum value of the stream. Now, in order for it to give me the minimum value, it now has to execute this code over here. So min, what does min return? Well, it returns a so-called, let's say this is min, and a so-called optional int. What does optional int mean? Well, it means that this either contains an integer value or contains no. Because when can it contain no? Well, if this array was empty, there's no such thing as a minimum element, right? Or if this array only contained two, uh, if only if it only contained three and one, well, again, 
after the filter operation x is going the stream x is going to be empty and let's call it at least stream so it's a bit more uh, clear what it is so if this array only contains one and three after i filter it and do the min operation well after filtering it the stream is empty right so because neither three nor uh, one are even numbers so an optional int because the stream doesn't know what it really contains meaning actually that the min value doesn't really know what the stream contains it can't guarantee that there is actually going to be a minimum value because if the stream is empty well then it can't give me a minimum value because there are no values okay so that's why it gives me an optional int and that optional int i can ask for a value so i can say system.out.println min dot and now if i say get as integer this is going to return the minimum value and if there isn't a minimum value well it's just going to uh, throw an exception so it's going to fail now what i can uh, what i can do to check is uh, or uh, or else and that's going to now if i type in let's say minus one here what's going to happen is it's going to try to return a minimum value, but if there isn't a minimum value, it's going to return minus one. So let's see how that works. Now, I'm going to place a breakpoint over here, and now you're going to notice that we're going to reach min. We haven't stepped inside this code yet, right? Okay, and I'm now I'm placing a breakpoint at the next position, but however, because I'm doing a min operation, and this is a so-called terminating operation, since I'm doing a terminating operation, the rest of the stream needs to be calculated so I can get my minimum value. I can't get the minimum value before I do the filtering, right? Because the minimum value over here is done after we've done the filtering. Okay, so now when I press F9, we're going to enter this filter operation. Okay, so now you notice that we're filtering the number one, and then we're filtering the number three, and now, what did we get for the min? Well, it's empty. Why is it empty? Because we only have one and three here and we filtered those out. So now what's going to be printed on the console is the value minus one because we said or else. So if this value has a value, print that or else return this value, which is minus one. Now let's add back the even numbers, two and four. And let's start it like that. Now again, we're going to reach this part. And when we ask for minimum, then the filtering is going to happen. Okay, so the filtering happens, it says one, two, three, and four. And once I get over here, now I'm going to see that this op optional int has the value of two written inside it. So now when I press F9, I'm going to get the value of two instead of the value of minus one. And I can ask it if I want to do conditional logic based on whether it found the value or not, I can ask stuff like if min dot is present meaning if there is a value then do something otherwise do something else okay so that's why it's an optional int and there is just optional over here too when it's not a primitive integer data type so optional int is specifically for in the primitive integer data type and primitive interface otherwise you're go just going to get optional which also has is present and stuff like that okay so this is what streams do they operate on some piece of data and now the way you actually do this would be you'd print this entire operation so you say print uh, dot min or else minus one so what did we do now now let's fold this back into a single expression um, I, i'm replacing it with a lambda now what did i do I wrote a single line which says, treat this as a stream of values. Filter those values so that, and I'll remove the breakpoint from here. Filter those values so only even numbers remain. How do I say that? Well, I just say filter and then provide an expression which determines whether a number should be included in the result or not. In this case, it re will return true for even numbers and it will return false for odd numbers so this expression if it returns true for a certain number for a certain parameter that number will be included in the stream from there on out and then i say calculate the minimum on that and then with that minimum if there is a minimum print the minimum otherwise print minus one oh meaning not print minus one but actually return minus one and this entire expression we're saving we're printing onto the console now if i extract this into a variable this is going to be the min result so 
I'm getting a result which is uh, the numbers converted into a stream, then filtered so that only even numbers remain, then the minimum of those, and if there is no minimum, meaning that if there are no items in the stream remaining, then it's minus one. Otherwise, it's the minimum. So, or else returns the minimum, uh, returns the optional thing if, if it is present, otherwise it returns minus one. Okay, so starting this, we will see two printed on the console, because that's the minimum from the filtered uh, data. Otherwise, one would be the minimum if we, if we weren't doing filtering. But since we are doing filtering and only two and four will remain, only those will be considered for the minimum operation. So that's how you do a, a stream operations on arrays. It's it's a simple syntax once once you get used to it. Now, if I had used get as integer instead of or else, well, in that case, if the data was empty, I would get an exception. So if I say get a synth, this is also valid. And for this case, it's going to print two again. So no difference. Let's see it. So if you're certain that you're going to get a result, you just call get a synth. However, if you're not certain, if the data could be, for example, one and three, this is going to crash. So if we start it, it's going to throw an exception. Let's wait a bit. Okay, so we got a no such element exception. Where did we get that? We get that we got that from get a synth. So that throws a no such element exception when it, it throws an error when it can't return a result. Okay, so you use get a synth if you're confident that there's always going to be a value, and you use or else if you're not confident. Or you might want to actually save the optional value, and in one case, so if it has a value, do something, and if it doesn't, do another thing. Okay, so these both in this case will return 15, whereas in this case for an empty array they will return 2. Okay, so max is the opposite of min, it just does the, it's the same concept but it finds the maximum value. Okay, so there are other neat things you can do with integer streams. So again, this is an int stream. If you save this into a variable, this is going to be an int stream. And int streams have some special functionality. Uh, unlike other streams. For example, if you have a stream of people, if you have a stream of the, the person object, it's not going to have stuff like directly calculating the minimum, because what's a minimum for a person? You'd need to supply a way to um, calculate what minimum for people means. You'd need to supply a comparator like you did for the sort operation. Okay, so this integer stream has other neat stuff, like for example, you can say sum. So dot sum. Now notice that I'm doing the sum over the filtered data. So if I do the sum now, that sum, now notice that get a synth got uh, false here. So sum directly returns an integer. Why does it directly return an integer? Well, because since this is an inter integer array, it knows that it can sum integers. And there's no such thing as no value. The sum of an empty list is zero, right? right? So no sum, zero. The sum starts from zero and every item gets added into the sum. So the sum has no option of being, uh, of lacking a value, unlike min, which does have an option of lacking a value. So sum just returns that sum. So it doesn't return an optional int, it returns an actual int. So if I start this, the result I'm going to get is zero because I'm filtering out all non-even numbers. However, if I add back the even numbers over here, I'm going to get the result of six. And again, the filtering operation only gets triggered once I actually start the sum operation. Up until that point, nothing gets done. We only get the operation once we reach the sum over here. That's a very important feature of streams. They delay the execution un until you actually need the data. Okay, so this is sum. You can guess what average does. And by the way, there's a neat function called uh, summary statistics, and this returns a uh, stats element. And that summary statistics has a lot of info. So for example, you can say stats.getAverage. You can say stat dot get sum, get min, get max, and so on. So if you need several of these values, you just return the stats object instead of just the average or the minimum or whatever, and then call the methods you need on them. Okay, so uh, average would return you a value. So let's see what average does actually. So if you say dot average, notice what it returns. It returns an optional double. 
Why is it an optional double? Well, because you can't have an average of zero values because that's not a number, right? So a sum of zero values is just the value zero, but uh, an average is the sum of the values divided by the number of the values. But if there are no values, well, what are you going to divide by zero? That's going to give you a weird number. So that's why average returns an optional double instead of the directly returning a result. And that optional double, guess what, has the same concepts as the optional integer. So you can say get as double if you're sure that you're going to get a result, or you can say or else, and that's going to return you a value, an actual value. So if there is no average, then you can return, let's say, minus one, or you can return zero and so on, whatever you decide to do. Or you can get the average into an optional uh, into an optional double. So you can say optional equals uh, this thing dot average, and then say if optional is present, is present, if we manage to calculate the value, otherwise, and then Either print if, if it is present, then you can print the value system dot out dot print line um, and print out the optional dot get as double. Otherwise, you'd print out system dot out dot print line option. Uh, you'd print uh, no numbers uh, or uh, the array is empty after filtering or whatever it is you need to print in your task. So if you don't have a value to print, you just detect that in the else case of the optional is present check and say whatever message you need to say, indicating that there is no information. Okay, so that's what average does. Now, how do we do how do you do this for collections? Well, you use pretty much the same logic. Now, here you're, you're going to see a sort of an it's a bit of an anti-pattern. Don't initialize lists like this. You can do it, but it's, there are a few reasons it's not good to do this. And you're going to learn about this when you get to the point of lessons about object-oriented programming. But in short, this just goes inside the array list class, creates a new array list class, and then tells it that it, when it gets initialized, it should add uh, 15, 25, and 35 to its values, meaning that this add gets called directly on this numbers object. I'd suggest that you just do nums.add15, nums.add25, nums.add35. It's, it's, better, it's better style. Okay, so what uh, can we do on uh, a list of numbers? Well, it's pretty much the same that you can do on a list of integers. So let's get these integers over here. And instead of having uh, an array of integers, so instead of creating arrays.stream, what you can have is you can create a list of integer, let's call them numbers again, which is a new array list of integers, and then add to these numbers one, then two, then three, then four. So one, two, three, four. And of course you could just do initialize an array list through the arrays.asList uh, constructor option. So you pass in an array list, uh, which, is which is constructed from a sequence of values. Okay. So we now have these numbers and now for arrays, it was specifically, you had to say arrays.stream and then pass in the array. For lists, it's just numbers.stream, so create a stream from this, and then you can do operations. Now, you also have minim minimum over here and maximum over here and so on. However, you need to provide parameters to minimum and maximum over here. So if you say min, calculate the minimum value, you need to provide the comparator which tells um, the stream how to calculate the minimum value. So since this is an integer uh, class, it's the integer box type, you need to specifically provide uh, something which tells the compiler how to compare. So one way you can do it is provide the same type of lambda you provided for uh, collections.sort. So you did say a and b go into a dot compare to b. Okay, so, so you basically say compare the numbers according to their natural order. Why? Well, because minimum now, since this is not just the primitive integer type, but it's an object and this could have been person. Now the stream can't know if this is a person or an integer or whatever. And that's why the minimum uh, operation over here just expects you to always tell it how to compare. 
So now if you say calculate the minimum, where do I get the minimum from? Well, you get it by uh, comparing the A and B value the way you would compare two A and B integer values. Okay, and now this returns guess what? Want to guess what it returns? Let's call it x equals this. It returns an optional integer. Remember that optional int, right? So this is like that. However, it's for the bigger type. It's not for the primitive int type. It's for the integer box type. So guess what this optional has? So if you say if x is present, it's the same method which you had on optional int, right? So if x is present, system.out.println uh, x and you uh, x dot get this returns the value this returns an integer object okay otherwise what would you do well you'd say otherwise print uh, for example no uh, items remaining and in this case if i start this code it's going to return one However, if I do a filtering over here, and let's do that in a bit, okay, so it told me the result is one. So the only thing I had to do was say, okay, so take this, uh, when you want to find the minimum of these numbers, in order to find out what a minimum is, to, to find out whether one number is less than another, if you have the number A and the number B, then treat them they're going to treat that A, treat them like A smaller than B if uh, they're ordered in this way. Okay. So this actually can be really replaced with comparator.naturalOrder. So someone has coded this lambda into a static method, comparator.naturalOrder, which just tells the min uh, operation to use the natural order of numbers. And if you don't want the natural order, but you want the reverse order, guess what? You have that as well. Okay. Or if you want to compare something else, you can say comparator.comparing and then you provide what you want to compare. So for each number, for example, compare the number uh, percent three. So compare its remainder when divided by three with uh, the other number. So you're saying when you're doing comparisons, use this value as an integer comparison value. That's what that's basically what you're uh, doing when you're saying comparator dot comparing. This is more useful if you're having an array of people and then you'd say if this was an array of person, then you'd say, for example, if you want to find the person with the least age, what you'd be doing is uh, comparator dot comparing person person goes into person dot get age and that would find the minimum person by age and it would return not an option of integer but an option of what of a person okay so this is re this returns an option of person and, and if my data was correct i'm initializing it with integers now but if this was initialized by uh, a list of people then this optional person over here x is going to contain the minimum person by their age so the person with the least age and you can even shorten this even more by doing like so comparing call get h on the person object but this might be a bit weird for you so let's leave the lambda in so compa comparator which compares people by what well by their age okay so there are other comparing uh, functions and you can play around with all of them we won't be uh, showing all of them now because it's going to take too much time but that's how you do it on lists so on lists you just say dot stream again there are a few details like minimum needs a comparator which to use the shortest way to do that is let's go back to the integer option the shortest way to do that is to just let's convert this into an integer again if you want the numbers compared if you want the smallest number well you need to compare them by the natural order so you you want the first item in the list to be the one uh, the first item the, the the item that minimum finds you want it to be uh, comparator dot the natural order so it's going to find the smallest item according to the natural order so the one that's closest to zero or the ones that, that whose value is the least if there are negative elements is going to uh, return the, uh, the the leftmost negative element whereas in leftmost I mean on the numerical axis where on the left you have the negative numbers and on the right you have the positive ones 
Okay, so natural order just means give me the smallest number. Now, you could say also max, which does the same thing, or you can play around and say minimum with the reverse order, and that's equivalent to maximum, right? So if you're looking them in reverse, if you're doing the reverse of the minimum, that's the maximum, right? And if you're doing the reverse of the maximum, that's the minimum. But I don't advise uh, you do this. You just use the natural order and min if you want the minimum and the natural order and max if you want the maximum. Okay, so starting this code, what it will do is print out the value of this optional because it will be present and that value will be 4. However, if we filter it and if we say, I want the stream to remove everything except values that are so how do we uh, put that in? Well, we have a number here and that number goes into, let's say, values that are larger than five or four. Well, this filter operation will actually leave my stream empty, right? Because no numbers of these are larger than five. And now when I start this code, I will get no items remaining because I filter out, filtered out everything from this list. So here we go, no items remaining. Okay, so that's what min does and that's what max does. Now, one other, one other thing you can do is just map the stream to an integer and just use that integer mapping to uh, use the old operations we used. So if you say map to int, this creates an int stream. Like, okay, let's see that. When, you, when we had an arrays.stream of an integer array, let's say this new integer of array of one, two, three, what we got here what this stream, what we got for this stream was an int stream, right? Okay, so if we tell these numbers to get converted into a stream, that's going to give me a normal stream, right? So if I create a local variable, the stream one is going to be a stream of integers. It's not an integer stream, it's not a specific stream for the integer uh, primitive type. It's a type for the capital case integer. Okay, so Instead, of, and I don't want this stream, what I want is an integer stream so I can do the operations I saw when um, we were talking about arrays because there it was easier to use minimum and maximum. Okay, so what I do here is I say map to, and there are several map to options. Map to int will convert it into an integer, primitive integer array. Map to double will convert it into a primitive double array. And map to long will convert it to a primitive long array. So any type of primitive array you can create, you can do over here. And you're probably thinking, well, I can't do a character array, right? Well, yeah, but characters are just a subset of integers, right? So characters are just smaller variables, variables smaller than int. Okay, so what I do is map to int, and it's going to ask me how I want it mapped. And what I'm going to say is each number map it to an integer by just using that number. So use the, the number as it is to convert it into an integer because it's going to ask me how should I convert it into an integer and, then, and I say just use the number itself. Or if I want the numbers multiplied by two, I do two multiplies number, right? So for each number multiplied by two and map that into an integer stream. So this stream now, if I, if I create a local variable, this is going to be an int stream, not just a stream. So I got an int stream again from my list stream, from my normal stream, I got back into an int stream. And you know how to calculate minimum and maximum and so on for an int stream, because we showed that uh, a few slides ago. Okay, so this is another way to use integer stream. So this is uh, another way to use maximum. I showed you, now you both have the option of using the slides uh, uh, variant, and you have the option of using what I did over here. I provided, uh, for max, I provided com a comparator so that it can do the uh, search operations. So you could use this, and I'd actually advise you to use this syntax if you're using something that isn't primitive integers, because it's going to allow you to change the data type into, for example, a person like we did a while back, and the code is going to remain the same, whereas here it won't remain the same because you can't convert people into integers. Or you can, but then you wouldn't get person results, you'd get integer results. Okay. So there are many ways, and by the way, if this seems a bit like Voodoo right now, well, it kind of is because we're just learning different functionalities of the Streams API. If this seems difficult, you don't really need to learn this right now. It's something that you could play around with 
but nothing prevents you from just implementing minimum, maximum, and so on as methods you just wrote, which work on arrays or lists and call them on your own. You don't need to use the stream API for all of this. We're just showing you this, these methods so that you can use them if you want to. Okay, so mapping to int, this map to int uh, method just converts, ignore the map part, it doesn't really create a map, it just does something for each of the values. And mapping to int, in this case, will just convert into all of these to int, to double, to long, will create an int stream, double stream, long stream, which are the primitive streams, streams for primitive arrays, special streams, which work with the primitive arrays. Okay, so what does map actually do? Well, map, ignoring the map to int part, well, it obviously converts into an int stream. But if you have a normal stream, any type of stream actually, but let's use this one. If you say map, so filter removes items, whereas map changes items. So if you say map each number to, what can we map it to? Well, if I just say map number to number, that's just going to uh, leave the result as it is. So this running it now, we'll find the maximum value using the natural order of these numbers mapped to themselves. So one will become one, two will become two, three will become three. So the maximum will be four. Okay. However, if I say map them like so, uh, multiply each number by four, then the maximum is going to be 16 because one will become four, two will become eight, three will become uh, 12 and four will become 16 and it will be the maximum so you can chain operations like this for example we can map them um, through this multiplication uh, and then filter out the ones that are less than five so i can say map them like so map them so that each number becomes itself multiplied by four and then filter any numbers that are less than 10 how do i say that well i say number goes into if number is larger than or equal to 10, then leave it in filter. If the expression is true, leave this value in. So now only numbers that are larger than or equal to 10 will remain. So what's going to happen? Well, one multiplied by four is four, two multiplied by four is eight, three multiplied by four is 12, and four multiplied by four is 16. So only 12 and 16 will remain in my stream. And the maximum will still be, um, will still be, uh, 16. So let's change that to min so that you see that there is actually a change over here. So that's what streams do for you. They, they just allow you to write single liners for, uh, for processing data. And it's really easy to, to chain them one after the other. So uh, one way you can type them out is like this. It's a bit easier to read. So what am I doing? I'm creating a stream. Then on that stream, on each item in that stream, I'm multiplying that item by four. And then from the result, I'm getting only those numbers which are larger than 10. And then from that, I'm getting the minimum value according to the natural order of elements. So pretty neat, kind of right? Four lines for doing something that you would otherwise do with four loops. And again, the, the biggest uh, upside of this is, is that each of these operations will be executed only once the min operation is called. So you can prepare this data as a stream. So up until this point, this is a stream. So you can use this stream, pass it on somewhere. And whenever the data is needed, then someone can call minimum on it. And only then will that data be calculated. It won't be calculated on each step. So if you have a very large amount of data, you can actually uh, reduce the number of operations you're going to be doing on it that way. Okay. Or at least postpone them until something, uh, uh, until something happens where a result is expected. Okay, so that's what map does. Map to int is just a shorthand that creates an int stream from a normal stream. So int streams and normal streams are different in the, in the fact that int streams work with the primitive integer arrays and the primitive integer arrays have stuff like uh, find the minimum value without having to provide the comparator, for example. Okay, so here we're just mapping each word into that word with triple I appended to the end of it. Okay, now we've reached the part of how we can convert a stream into a collection. And before we talk about that, we're going to do a break and then finish up with what, what else we have from this lecture. So what else we have? We have how can we convert these results for which we've only used uh, aggregation. So minimum is an aggregation, right? So minimum means get the minimum value, not uh, 
we're not getting the entire list, we're just getting the minimum value. So now continuing with the last part of our lecture, we already saw how we can use streams to filter out data. We saw how we can reduce that data to a single variable, for example, the minimum, the maximum, the average, and so on. Uh, now let's see how we can get a collection from the stream which we're using. So in many cases, you won't be reducing to a single value. You'd just be filtering out data, for example, filtering out all people with an age less than 18. So you don't uh, get them into the bar, for example, or filtering out all people which don't have enough money to pay the entrance for the bar or whatever it is uh, you're operating. So uh, in that case, you get a result which isn't a single person you'd, or hopefully um, you, you'd get a list of values. So you'd still need to do the filtering, you'd maybe sort them, for example, you'd sort them by the ones that, uh, let's say, have the most money, and then you'd serve them first. But still, you'd still, after filtering and sorting and whatever you, you're doing with them, you're still going to get a result, which is uh, a list of values, a sequence of values. So up until this point, we've only seen how we can uh, get a single value. Now, let's do it again by playing around first with uh, an array and then with a list because as we saw the primitive arrays are handled a bit differently than uh, list streams okay so let's create an array and let's say that it's a person array so it's a bit more fun using the data so it's a person array and we'll call it people um, no actually let's start with the integer the primitive integer arrays because they're different whereas a person array isn't really different from the normal streams okay so let's create an integer array and let's call it numbers again and let's initialize it with a new integer array containing the numbers one two and three okay so what do we do from here well uh, let's uh, let's say we want to filter out any numbers which are not uh, even just like we did previously. So how did we do that way? Well, we say arrays create a stream out of this numbers array and then filter that numbers array in what way? Well, I want for each number in that numbers array to for you to keep that number only if the number is even, meaning that the division of the number by two gives a remainder of zero. And if we get that result, well, then the, that the number that number gets to remain in the stream. Again, we're now working on this stream, not on the array itself. The stream is just a copy of this data and it works on the copy of the data. So at least it's the copy of the numbers. OK, so we have these uh, numbers over here. And now what do we do? Well, uh, we want to get the remainder. So we, we want to get the remaining number. So let's make this one, two, three, and four, like we did before. Okay. So how do we convert this back into an array since we had an array initially, and we want a new array, which only contains the filtered elements. Well, we say to array. Now there are several ways to do this uh, conversion to an array. Um, and this is just one of them. But since you have an integer stream like this one, because arrays.stream, creates an int stream. You remember that, right? So this is an int stream. Okay. Now on an int stream, you can uh, say dot to array and that will just generate an array from this int stream. So these are int filtered. So filtered numbers, or even I could call them even numbers. And now if I want to print these numbers out, I could just say even alt enter iterate for each integer and even just system dot out dot print it out. So print that integer number on the console. So that's one way to do it. You just call the to array method. If you have an int stream, only int streams have the to array method. Now notice that this is a cool way to parse the input. We've done this before. So what are we doing? So we have to infer for this input. Now, if this input was strings, so let's convert these into strings. So these are strings. And what are we doing with these strings? Well, we need to parse them into numbers. So let's say that this is a string array numbers, a new string array of numbers. Okay. And now how do we uh, filter them? Well, we, in order to filter them by whether they're, uh, um, whether they are even or not, we need to first parse them into integers, right? But how do we parse them? Well, each of these values is a string and I want each of these values to be converted into an integer. So how do I do it? Well, I want to do an operation on each value. So I'd say map 
okay? So I'd say, and, if, and since I'm going to be using an integer array, so I'm starting with an integer array, and I want to continue using an integer array because I'm con converting it back to an integer array, I'd say instead of just map, because that would return a stream, not an int stream, if I say map to int, that will return an int stream. So I'd say for each number in these numbers, uh, for each number string, so since this is a number string, right? So at this point, the numbers are just strings. These strings, one, two, three, and four. Now mapping them to int will get me a string and I want to convert this string to a what? I want to convert it to a number. So I'd say integer dot parse int of this number string. Okay, so let's separate them on separate lines again. Okay, and then I'd filter out the non-even ones, and then I'd convert it to an array. Now, IntelliJ is uh, suggesting that I change this into a method reference. So if you say map to int, instead of, if you're doing just one thing, you're just calling, calling parse int over a number, you can replace it with a method reference like so. You can just say call parse int, and Java handles what, how it should call it and what parameters it should supply. But the, if this is confusing to you, just use the lambda. So map to int, how do we map it to int? Well, we take the string and we parse it into an integer and use that value into, in the mapping to int. And we use the to int instead of just map, <clears throat> because when we just map, we're going to receive um, a stream of the integer object, not the primitive int. And we want to remain with the primitive int so we can get the array. Okay. So map to int does that for us, and to array converts this back into an array. Now, if I just used map, let's do that. If I just used map instead of map to int, I can still convert this into an array, but notice what result I'm going to get. Even uh, boxed. Uh, there's a reason I'm calling them boxed. Okay, so notice what I'm getting. I'm getting an object array because it, I've done the mapping to integer over here, but how can it know what type of uh, object I'm getting? So how can it know that this continues to be an integer array? It can't. Now, one way to do that is to provide a generator over here. And now I can say, okay, so this even box thing isn't just uh, an integer. It's an integer array and call it new. Now, what's this going to do? Well, this is going to create an integer array of this boxed type. So this isn't the primitive type, it's the box type. How did I do that? I said, I want an integer array. That's how you create an integer array, right? So this is the non-primitive integer array. And I wanted it to call the new operator of that integer array. So this is just like how here we can rep replace integer.parsint with integer uh, column column parsing so call this method in the same way I tell it to call the new method of integer array meaning initialize an integer array so if this seems a lot weird to you not just a little weird to you I can I can understand that that's because you're seeing it for the first time and it's a bit unusual for syntax um, and you're going to understand it better once you know more about classes ob uh, classes objects interfaces and so on so if this is too weird for you, you can just use the first option. So if you want to stick with array streams, you just say map to int or map to double or map to whatever that stream is. Okay, so, and again, this is not the primitive type. This is the boxed type, which can contain nodes in it. It won't in this case, because we're just doing parsing operations, but again, it can. Okay, so let's start this and we're going, we're going to see two and four printed out on the console because they have been parsed into integers and then checked for being even and only they have remained. So two and four over here. Okay, so you can now use this code to read a line of integers from the console. How would you do that? Well, here's the string array. Well, how do you read a line of uh, integers from the console? Well, you read a string line. So you have a scanner, you say dot next dot next line and then split that into spaces. I won't be initializing the scanner now because that would waste a bit of time, but you get the idea. You just split this, you get the string list, like this one over here, and you just pass it on to the stream and then start converting the numbers. And you can filter them out too. Now, if you don't want to filter them out, well, of course, this line will not be there. Okay, so that's how you convert an array stream back into an array. Now, if you want to convert a normal stream back into a list, you use the dot collect method and you tell it how you want to collect it. And there are a few collectors which uh, are implemented for you. For example, you can say collectors collect collectors dot to list, 
But what does this do? Well, it produces a list. So same thing like you did for the arrays. For example, over here when we um, when we added this even box, if I wanted this to be a list of integers instead of an array of integers, I could have set dot collect collect the the job of collect unless uh, un, uh, unlike map and filter, which are intermediate operations, which just do operations on the data at some point when the data is requested, collect like minimum and like to array and maximum and average and so on are terminating methods, terminating stream operations, which put an end to the stream and extract the values from it. So collect will extract the values from the stream in some way. And one way you can use to extract the values from the stream is using the collectors, collectors dot to list. And that will tell the data to be converted into a list. And now you're get, going to get an, a list of integers instead of uh, just a collection, uh, instead of a stream of integers or instead of an array of integers. By the way, you can't assume what list you're getting over here. You're, you're getting some list, but what list is going to be, you can't know. So if you want to convert this into an array list for which you're certain that you can do add operations and remove operations and so on, you just pass all of this into the array list constructor. So from this point on, once you've wrapped this into an array list, this can add elements, remove elements and so on. Before that, you're not guaranteed that you can. It could fail if you do such operations. So this is how you convert it into a list. OK, so that's pretty much it. Uh, I already saw, uh, I already told you how you can do filtering operations, so we're not going to be discussing those. You, the filtering operation just accepts a lambda, which determines whether the item should remain in the stream or not. And if it shouldn't, it just doesn't remain in the stream. So it's a pretty simple operation, but we're going to solve this task. We're reading a string array and we're printing only words with, which have an even length. So we, we want a resulting list for which the length is even. Okay, so Kiwi has four letters, uh, Orange has six letters, so it's included also. Banana has uh, how many? Six letters again, so it's included also. However, Apple is not included because this is three plus five, which is five let uh, three plus three plus two, which is five letters. So that's not an even number. So we're not going to get that into the resulting list, and we need to print that out on the console. Okay, how do we do that? Well, let's read. A line of strings and split it into the words it contains. So let's create a scanner. We're going to remove this list this, uh, array of numbers. So let's create a scanner and call it scanner and initialize it by telling it to read from, from system.in. Okay. And tell the scanner to read the next line. And that line we want split into an array of strings by spaces. Okay, so we got the array of strings into uh, by spaces. We're not going to be parsing it into an integer. We're just getting a stream from this array. Okay, so what do we do now? Well, we want this thing to only leave in the strings which have a length of two. So we're filtering not by numbers, we're filtering by words. And we want only the words for which what? For which the length percent two equals zero. So only the words with even length. Okay, and what are we going to convert this into? Well, since this is an array, let's convert it back into an array. So let, what are we going to get here? Let's say that these are the uh, words. Initialize it with this. Whoops, we got an object uh, array. Now, if we want to convert this into a non object array, what do we want to provide in here? Well, if we want a string array of words, then we just copy this string array and then write column, column, new. And this would initialize a new string array. And if we want it into a list, we just say dot collect and say, we want to collect we want you to collect it using the to list operation and that will return a list of string words so both are good enough in our in our case we don't really care what the data is going to be since we're just going to be printing it so we're just going to say for these words over here iterate them and for each of those words system.out.print that word on the console okay so that's how you get a list from another list or from another array and uh, filter out some of its data and print it on the console. Okay, so let's get some of this input and test that this 
uh, code actually works correctly. So pasting this in, we got kiwi, orange and banana, which are the expected output. Okay, so we got this uh, done. Now what do we want to do from here on out? Well, let's see the other functions which we haven't yet seen. Now this is the solution. One of the solutions would be to use the string new to array con uh, conversion. The other one, which I implemented, was to use the list conversion. Okay. Now, one other thing you can do with collections like this is to sort them. So you can say dot sorted on a collection of strings. So these words, let's say we want not just to print out the words with which are of even length, we want those words to be sorted in some way. What you can do is just say sorted. Now, what does sorted do? Well, it sorts based on the natural order of the object. So if I start this, we're going to get banana first and then, which is L-M-N, K-O-M-N. So banana, kiwi, and orange. That's what we're going to get printed out on the console. Uh, kiwi, banana, and orange, banana, kiwi, and orange. So sorted uses the natural sorting order. So sorted does, it's again an intermediate operation. It will not calculate anything until someone collects the data or finds the minimum or um, finds the maximum or converts it into an array and so on. It's an intermediate operation just like filter is. By the way, notice that first I'm filtering and then I'm sorting. Why? Well, because it's easier to sort less items. So it will take less time to sort uh, less items than uh, than all of them. And sorting is a slower operation than filtering. So if I can remove some of the items with the faster operation, then I should do that and then only sort. Okay, so that's how I sort uh, with sorted. Now, this is the default sort, just like we get the default sort from collections.sort. So that's the, the, the default sorting operation. And you provide in, for example, words. Just like in the default sorting, just like in collections.sort, you can provide a comparator which says how sorting should be done. For example, let's say we want to sort the words not by their natural order, but by their reverse order. How would we do that? Well, we'd say comparator dot, if we wanted the natural order, well, that's what we supply and that's the default. And if we want the reverse order, well, we type in reverse order and now we'll get um, orange, kiwi and banana. Let's see that. Pasting in orange, kiwi, and banana printed out in the reverse order. So sorted accepts a comparator and you can compare by anything you like. For example, let's um, order them first by their, um, okay, let's just order them by their length and see what happens. How did we say we, we could uh, do a comparison by a certain criteria where we can use comparator.comparing meaning we can tell sorted by what to compare. So for each word compared by that word's length, right? So now if I start this, what's going to happen? Well, I'm going to have the shortest words first. So pasting this, I'm getting kiwi and then orange and then banana because kiwi is the shortest. Now orange and banana have the same length. What if I want to um, compare different? Uh, so if the lengths are equal, how can I then compare by something else? So let's say if uh, the lengths are equal, I want to compare by alphabetical order only then. So I want kiwi and then, o and then banana and then orange because banana and orange are of the same length, but banana has uh, leads lexicographically. Well, now I wouldn't uh, be able to use these uh, fun comparators. I need to write my own comparator. So how did I write a comparator? Well, well, I said A and B are the items you're comparing and compare them in the following way. Now I'm going to need a, a, a bit more space to compare them. So what I do is see if these two are equal because if they're equal, if their lengths are equal, so let's get their lengths int a length equals a dot length and int b length equals b dot length. Okay, so if their lengths are equal, I need to compare the, I need to compare them lexicographically. So if a, if a length equals b length, and actually now that I think of it, I don't really need these variables, right? So if a length equals b length, then compare those. Now I can't say a length dot compare to b dot length. And the reason I can't is that length is the primitive integer. So 
um, for primitive integers, what you use is integer in integer dot compare because primitive integers aren't objects and they don't have the dot operator so you need to use this one a dot length b dot length okay and i return this i return this comparison if they're uh, sorry if, if not if they're equal if they're different so i only need to compare them if they're different that's what i'm checking if they're different let's compare them and if they're not different if they're equal so in this case in the else they're equal then what do i what do i need to return well i need to return whether a is before b lexicographically so i need to a dot compare to b so if i'm if i have different lengths i compare the lengths if I have equal lengths, I compare the words themselves. Okay, so now if I start this, this is comparison by multiple criteria. So you sort the item A and the item B and you say, okay, so if the item A's length is equal to, is different than B's length, then compare A's length to B's length. And you remember that compare just does a subtraction and sort uses that subtraction to decide whether to switch around their places or not. Otherwise, if their lengths are equal, well then, compare them in a different way. Compare A as a string with B as a string. And this comparison operates on a different uh, uh, on a different logic. So it uses the lexico lexicographical ordering of the characters, but it's pretty much the same as integer.compare only done on each character at one at a time on the two strings. Okay, so pasting it in this data. Now I have kiwi first because it has the least amount of characters then i have banana because it has equal characters as orange but it is uh, sooner lexicographically so i've fallen into i've seen that their lengths are equal and i've gone into this comparison meaning compare them by their uh by their values me compare compare them lexicographically okay so that's what I did there. And that's what sorting actually does. It allows you, so if you say dot sorted, that sorts the results of the stream in some way, which if you don't provide a parameter is the natural order. And I showed you a few ways in which you can provide different parameters. And now here we have another uh, example of this. We have products, which is a map of integer and strings. So the price of the product and the name of the product. Uh, this example would have been better served with a list of a class named product actually which has an integer and a string But this is a different way to implement that. So it's uh, it's still worth uh, checking out So what they're doing here is we have an integer and a string for each product and those are So element 1 and element 2 have each a key and a value and the key is the price and the string is the name And what do we do? Well, we compare the name and if the names are equal, then we compare the values. So uh, if their names, if their strings are equal, then we compare the prices of those uh, products. Okay. So now here we have a for each, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, what is the for each? Now, up to this point, we've used, uh, once we've created a result, we've collected it into a string, or we've collected it into... Uh, an array or we've collected it into a minimum or maximum now since this isn't always what we want because imagine you have a huge amount of data like, like say um, 10,000 elements creating a list for those 10,000 elements then placing those elements in the list and then iterating them takes a lot of time now, if I just want to do something with those elements, if I don't want to store them for future use, if I just want to do some operations on them, for example, print them on the console, because that's going to be a common enough occurrence, I don't really need to collect them into a list. What I can do is do another terminating operation, which is called for each. Okay, so what does for each do? Well, for each does this for each loop, which I'm doing over here. So. We're saying, just like here, we're saying system.out.println the word. Here, in for each, we get a word or whatever that data item is over here. And we print it out on the console. And now we're not going to be assigning it to a list since it's just an operation on these items. And now we don't need the for each loop. So what did we do? We just replaced the for each loop and the conversion into a list. We, we saved some operations because when you do the for each over here, it iterates each item, so it does your for each loop for you, and it leaves you to write this part of the code, the body of the for each loop, inside the lambda. Okay, 
So that's better. Why is it better? Well, because if you collect it to a list, that's one operation of copying everything into a list. And then you have another operation of iterating the list and printing out each word. Here, if you just do the for each, it just operates on each of the words separately and you don't need to allocate all of the memory to copy this stream into that uh, into that memory furthermore this stream could not even have a, uh, a finite end because it's completely possible for this stream to be something that's being read from let's say uh, the internet so you're having a network and you're receiving bytes of information Let's say you're playing a game and you're receiving information on the state of the game at each moment. So you're getting that as a stream from the web and you need for each part of that information to update the game state. Now, you wouldn't be trying to download all of the information from the web to get the game state, right? Because that's not going to work. Instead, you can just for each the results once once you've done whatever operations you need to free to, you need to do on those results and then for each each item in the result when it arrives and do the operation on it so for each game state update you update your own game state locally so so that's one pretty theoretic theoretical usage but you get the idea for each does not require you to allocate a huge list or array in which to save all of that data you, on each operation you do just you access just one of the elements. So this allows you to access element by element, only a single element from the data instead of having to copy all of it and then uh, iterate all of that. Okay, so that's what for each does. Otherwise, it's pretty much the same as a normal for each loop. So in this case, we're just using it to print out the words on the console. It's going to give us the exact same result. So kiwi, orange, banana, and apple, when we put it in, we're just going to get the results printed out now you do the for each one you you only care about one item at a time if for some reason you need to compare items inside the list or search for the two uh, closest items in the list by value well then yes of course you're going to be collecting collecting that into a list so if you need a list for something later on of course you collect that into a list but if you don't need a list and you just need to print out a result or calculate the sum or something uh, then you just for each it with this for each terminator of the stream okay so here's an example of uh, all of this in some sort of a weird way we get we're getting a stream from the entry set of a map and then we're sorting it and then we're doing operations on that sorted uh, array and that's the product sorting by the way we saw that a few slides ago and then we're doing the for each on each of the items and printing its results so this is the same as a for each on a normal map however it's done through uh, the uh, the lambdas and the stream api in java 8 instead of just with a for each loop which is iterating the entry set of the map now should you do this always instead of a normal for each loop no the only reason you're going to be using these streams, and I repeat myself, but I'll say it again because it's important, you use these streams when you have some simple um, one-liner that you want to write, which is easy to read. Now, this is sort of on the border of whether this is acceptable as, as a um, stream pipeline of operations, because this is a complex sorting operation, and this should be a separate method extracted out somewhere. And if that method is uh, extracted out somewhere, then yes, maybe in that case, you could uh, argue that you uh, can use this as a stream pipeline. So if I extract this into a method and say, compare by length then by value so value in the case of the string value then lexicographically compare by length then lexicographically okay so now if i replace this with an expression now this is a clean way to do a stream api pipeline so we get input from the console, we filter out all words that are uh, of uh, non-even size, then we sort it by length and then lexicographically. So this is readable text now. And then for each word I print it on the console. Well, that's much better code than what I had previously. So you, you should try to have your lambdas just a si in, in a single expression. If you can't write a single expression, either don't use lambdas, or meaning uh, write a for loop, or 
extract methods so that your code is readable. So this is pretty readable. It's, it's a bit more readable than uh, using for each loops uh, one after the other because this answers the question of what happens and now not, not how it happens because when you're coding a for loop you're, you're writing how something should happen not what should happen and here we're saying what should happen it's sh there should be a filtering then there should be a sorting by length and then lexicographically and then there should be a printing on the console for each item this is easy to read however the previous code before i extracted the method was not really easy to read so you should when you should only use streams when you can make your code easier to read and make it uh, reflect what its purpose is more clearly. If you're just trying to be fancy with using streams, don't. It, there are a lot of things you will be uh, fancy with once you uh, learn to code a lot more. So this is not really not the place where you should be just trying to impress your colleagues with one-liners. Only do this when you're certain that this is e more easily readable than just having a for each loop. Okay, so that's the functional for each. And we have one more task over uh, ahead of us. We have three numbers and we should print the largest three. And if there are less than three, well, print all of them. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, there is one more method we need to learn, which is pretty important when we're using streams. Let's first read our numbers. So the first part is going to be the same, right? So we're reading a single line from the console, splitting it by spaces. Then what are we going to be doing with that? Well, I want to convert this into integers. And since it's easier to work with uh, the integer arrays because they have a bit more functionality, let's convert it into those. So how do I create an integer stream from this? Well, I say map to int because I want an, a primitive integer stream. So for each word, I want to get what? I want to get an integer. How do I get that? Well, I say integer dot parse int of that word. And that's going to give me, up to this point, I'm getting um, a list of um, uh, a stream of primitive integers. So that's pretty much like an array of primitive integers. So we've parsed our numbers up to this point. And now what do we do? Well, we want the largest tree. And then we need to print all of them. And notice that the largest tree are sorted in reverse order. So we want the largest tree, so the maximum, the next maximum, and the next maximum, and we want those in reverse order. Now we have a few ways to do that, but we'll do the simple um, implementation first. So uh, we're going to print, we're going to get these numbers which we just got over here, and we're going to sort them. But we're not going to sort them normally. We're going to sort them with how? We want them, we want the largest tree, and notice that they are ordered again in reverse order. So. We want all of them sorted in reverse order. We want collections dot sort, uh, not that. Collect um, comparator. How do we want to compare them? Well, we want to be comparing them with the comparator, which uses the reverse order. So we want them in reverse. Now, what doesn't uh, dislike about this? Uh, yeah. So what it doesn't like is this is the reverse order. But reverse order works for comparator and t. Now remember when you have this type of brackets, like for list of t uh, or map of k and k and v and so on, uh, these uh, these operations work on the uh, on the object streams. So the comparator dot reverse order works on the object stream. So and now I here here I have an integer stream, a primitive integer stream. So instead of converting it to a primitive integer stream, I'll just convert it into a normal stream. So I start with an array stream, then I convert it, I map it into an object stream. Each of these objects is an integer parsed from the console. And then I sort them with comparator dot reverse order. Now, of course, I could have remained with the array stream, with the int stream, but that would have required me to implement my reverse order manually, which would, would have looked like so. A and B go into um, integer dot compare B then A, right? So because reverse order just means comparing them in reverse. And then in that case, I could have used map to int and that would have been just as well. Okay. However, I'm not going to be using that now. I'm going to be using comparator.reverse order over a normal stream, over a normally mapped stream, over an object stream. So reverse order, natural order, and so on are usable on uh, on uh, on object streams, whereas 
primitive streams, which are mapped to int, can't use reverse order directly. You need to implement it yourself. Okay, so we've sorted it and we need to print out all the items, but not, not all of them, just the last, uh, just the three of the three of them, which are the topmost items. So for each number, I'd call it over here, I need to print out that number. Okay, but how do I limit that to just the first three items? Well, there's a limit function, imagine that. Limit just says only take the top three results, the first three results. So let's see what this is going to do. It's going to read a line from the console, split it into space it, map, map each of the words on that line into an integer, meaning convert it into an integer, then sort it in reverse order, whatever it got from over here, then only get the first three items, and then iterate those first three items. Okay, let's see if that works. So let's get this input over here and paste it down below, and we got 50, 30, 20. Now, in the task, we want them on the same line, so I'll leave that to you. Guess how we can do that on the same line? Well, print line and add a space at the, at the end. Yeah, I just said leave that to you, and I did it instead of you, but it's a pretty simple task, so it's not a big loss that I implemented it instead of you. Okay, so what does limit do? It gives you the first three results. It limits the results to only the, the first three, so you don't have to for each everything. Okay, so that's uh, basically all, in, all, all the basic operations on streams covered. We did a lot of stuff. Uh, again, it might have looked a bit magical. There's another solution here done with a different way. So we're sorting them, then we're collecting them into a list. And then that list, we're uh, iterating only the first three elements. Now this is suboptimal because this will copy the entire list and then we'll iterate only the first three items. That It's not ideal. Uh, that's why I prefer the limit operation, which will limit it before copying, before doing the for each operations. Now you could also you could also actually do limit tree and then collect it as a list. Then say uh, collect this uh, with collectors dot to list, and that will give you a list, right? So this is a list um, top three. So this is the top three list. How do I know that there are three elements? Well, because I limited it to three elements before I converted it into a list. And now I can uh, calmly run a for each loop on these top three and print them all. If there are less than three, we're just going to get the, the less uh, amount of items. So limit takes the top three or however many there are. If there aren't three, it, if there are only two, it's going to get the, the only the two of them. Okay, so we saw a lot of stuff. Some of these things might have seemed magical, but it's just a matter of getting used to the syntax. Again, don't overuse the streams, please. If you're not confident when writing a stream, just use a for each loop. It's perfectly fine, and sometimes it's a bit faster even. Uh, when you get to processing large amounts of data, yes, then you'd need to um, use the, uh, when then you would really need to use uh, streams. But for small amounts of data for these uh, lessons, which we're uh, studying now, you don't really need those streams that much but if you can use them in such a way that your code is easily readable and understandable then sure go for it and we talked about maps and we've talked about how these maps can hold keys and values inside them and th those keys are unique and that you can overwrite them if you uh, try to write to the same key again and that they're a good way to index something by some of its fields any of those fields so if you have an integer array, you can only index by integers. However, for maps, you can index by anything you want, and then you can quickly search for anything you want by that index. And we showed you the Streams API, and again, please don't overuse it. Uh, I'm happy to have de delivered this lesson to you, and if you have any questions, please ask them in the uh, channels which we have provided for you. And well, until, until next time, see ya! Did you like this lesson? Do you want more? Join the Werner's community at softunit.org. Subscribe to my YouTube channel to get more free video tutorials on coding and software development. Get free access to the practical exercises and the automated judge system for this coding lesson and many others. Get free help from mentors and meet other Werner's. Join now, it's free, softunit.org.